The following stream contains mature content and subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. And good evening, everyone. Welcome to McStaver Studios, Kansas City, a domain divided. Of course, I'm the storyteller, Shanky McStaver. Uh, I think at least as long as they'll let me storytell this crew. We'll see. And hi, I'm Mom McStaver, and I will be the moderator for this night's stream. So please, as I've posted in the chat, use your channel points, which you get those for being a follower and participating in our streams by viewing and chatting, and you get more for chatting in the stream. Um, but yeah, so use those points, spend 100 of them to highlight your message when you post a question. That way it's easier to stand out so that I can see it. And I play Dr. Katerina Ricosi of Clan Zamitzi. And I'm Dale, and I play Callum McFarlane of Clan Ventru. I'm Reen, I play Rashad Giovanni of the Hakata. I'm House, I play Bo Solomon, Clan Toreador. And as everybody can see tonight, unfortunately, Mischievous Red, who plays Gwen Schultz. Schultz? Schultz. Schultz. I always mess it up. Uh, she's not with us tonight. It's unfortunate. So any questions you have specifically for her, put them in the KC uh our Kansas City Domain Divided chat on our Discord. She'll answer them when she's available again. So uh, I will let Mama start this off as she's the moderator, not me. Yeah. So thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. We already have some questions that are highlighted in the chat. So I'll kick them off. Astral Aberration coming in strong with biggest emotional gut punch for the season for storyteller in each character slash player. I don't think I had a good gut punch. I mean, I did like the reactions to everybody by hitting multiple dire fucking premonitions on the last episode. I did think that was fun. But that's just because I'm sick in the head like that. <laughs> For me, it was Kat sending her family away. For um, me, go ahead, Ring. For me, I was going to say it was it was probably the, the final Sabat Sabat battle, really, with all those with all those dead people. That one cost you uh, yeah. humanity. Yeah, uh, mine episode two of the season, finding out that my mother is not just a wraith but uh, a drone, and just living her moment of death on repeat. Super think, fun. Yeah. 
I think for me, it was, uh, for me personally, it was the, my, the staff of the restaurant getting turned and used against us. But for, for Callum, I think it was, uh, watching Bo leave the two of us as we're getting ready to encounter something. Making me feel bad. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'll remember this. <laughs> lean, <laughs> lean into it, Dan. <laughs> Here at Mixtaver Studios, we love our lunch. revenge. It's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> it's, what you get, it's what you get for having our restaurant get blown up. Exactly. I, I will say a close Inviting second. Inviting Becky to the restaurant. <laughs> a close second, I'll be fair, was uh, the viewer's reaction to Cameron. And everyone going, oh God, he's gonna get killed. He's gonna die. He's I mean, that's the YouTube comments, that's yeah. the, the viewers. Everyone's like, oh my god, he's gonna die. Oh yeah. it's almost like it's predictable that I'm gonna put this player in there. Uh what right. it's like y'all saw Windy City and knew what happened to the last mage I put in my game. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not gonna make Gwen kill him. I mean, I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you touch on a good point, not not to get away from the, the crux of the question, but Beetlespock did a damn good job as Cameron. Oh, my God. Like, he brings so many feels. If, yeah, if, sure. there, if in story there was a way he became a main character, mm -hmm. with whether Gwen's doing or not, like, I would be so thrilled because every time he and Gwen interact and then this interaction with the whole group was, was fucking able. delicious. Yeah. The two of them bring the feels. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> it's going to be great. I'm not saying something bad's going to happen to him. Of course it is. What? It's a shanky crime. You're not, you're not not saying I'm that not either. not saying it. I'll be honest. Um, his survival, 100%, like everything, depends on the players mm -hmm. and the story. Yeah. Um, there's going to be some tough challenges for that character, and it's possible you can save him. Look, I had people survive a one-shot. Yeah. Or a mini series of vampires. So Just it's gotta possible. think creatively. But <laughs> I will not have Persephone uh send him to the Lady of Fate and have his uh avatar ripped out of him and forged into a mask. I'll promise that. I did God, that, that in Windy City. So brutal. Yeah, I won't do that a second time. As a mage player, that was fucking and I mean Ravnos Archon literally shattered our fucking avatars briefly for a moment. Yeah. And that was tragic. But what you did was Fucking heinous. Yeah, even Ravnus <laughs> Archon, who didn't know that was the, the story, even he afterwards said, dude, that got me. So I'm not going to do that. I did that already. I'm going to do something new. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that was just heinous. Huh? Well, death is only a state of being when you have necromancers <laughs> around. So that's fine. Yeah, that's but fine. for Come a mage, back. it's a fucked up state of being because you're not a mage anymore. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Astro asked another question. Most enjoyed scene for cast and storyteller? Okay, I'm going to go right off with this one. Mm -hmm. um, Johnny was, a hundred, was an improv thing for me. I did not expect, you know, I created him on the fly. I did not expect him to be so fun. But uh, Johnny right now is my favorite NPC because he's just so fun yeah, for me as storyteller. Uh, the scene... Not the first scene. The scene he met you, he came at the 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 casino, the illegal gambling hall, and gave everyone nicknames. Mm. Everyone's reaction to suddenly having a nickname was fucking hilarious because none of y'all knew that was coming, and I just threw that in there. I've got two of them. They're tied. One is the conversation that Cat had with Rashad. Where basically Rashad was coming to her kind of as a fellow outsider, an outcast, to say, you know, this is what's expected of me. I don't know if that's what I want to do. And Kat being able to tell him, look, if you do what you want, march to your own drum, you know, and that was just a beautiful scene. It was a beautiful fucking scene. So thank you, Reefer initiating that that was a lovely scene to participate in um and then second was the actual fight with johnny because that was fun as fuck <laughs> it was just 
flirtatiously scrapping, and it was hilarious. <laughs> uh, there was a there's a, a train of thought behind Johnny. My initial, even though I improved him, I didn't plan him. But as soon as I said I was going to have decided to have a brouhaha, which was in the moment because it was based on the players' actions, not mine. Uh, I decided to show a different brouhaha. Uh, you've seen the angry, overly emotional brouhaha. You've seen the the overly serious brouhaha. I wanted to show a brouhaha, the, the showboat, who doesn't take himself seriously. He's good. He's competent. But he's all about the flamboyance of, you know, I am what I am. You know, he's passionate about, well, in some ways himself, <laughs> but also about the show, the, you know, the mystique of himself. Uh, well, for me, I would say it's definitely between uh, the Rashad and Katarina scene. That was amazing. And uh, the, the end of season uh, premonition. That was really dope. Uh, that's what I, it's what I take the power for. So those those cryptic moments, especially uh, that that one uh, that you haven't seen, you should definitely go and check out. Um, but for me, those would be those two. Uh, I think the whole Elysia episode was a blast. Just so much getting to be quippy and just say insults and yeah, no, I had a good time there. Yeah, I, th I think I'm with Dan on that one. The Elysia scene. That yeah, was that fun. was also a, a fun lot of good one. stuff, but you yeah, you there's just, so uh, many. Yeah, <laughs> didn't have to worry about combat there. You could just be your smart ass self. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And kind of similar situation with like the, the casino stuff, though Bo's pride was a little hurt when Gwen beat him, but that's <laughs> neither here nor there. She got a lot of rolls, a lot of dice on that. I got to give a shout out to our guest players that we've had so oh. far. Uh, Ravnos Archon, Maddox, and Beetlespock, that all of them have legit just shaken up things. They have brought flavor to our story that we just wouldn't have otherwise. And it's so much fun to play with them. And the reason we uh, do that, honestly, is guest players can shake up the table dynamic, not in a bad way, but it can bring something unexpected from the table dynamic because the table plays together. They play with each other. You throw a, another person in there and suddenly the whole dynamic shifts for an episode. And then it goes back to the way it was. And it's great. I love it. Like, I loved in that Elysia scene, Dale, when Callum fucking walked up and literally just had his back to Rurik. I fucking <laughs> loved that shade. That was so gorgeous, glorious. <laughs> That's like pure Venture shade, that too. That was such Venture yeah. fucking shade. It's like, I don't even acknowledge you. <laughs> well, I, I, I know how you feel about him, so. <laughs> <laughs> it was brilliant. <laughs> So we still got Bo and Callum's favorite scenes. No, they oh, I said, did. I said, I said they Elysia. Yeah, for both of us. Yeah, yeah. they both. Did I, Elysia and I'll, scene. it's well known. I hate Elysia scenes. Yeah, he does. That's why you don't see a lot of kindred <laughs> in the, in any given Elysia. It's why there's always a bunch of Elysias in the city because I can explain not many in there because there are other Elysias that night because mm. it's a pain in the ass trying to manage that many NPCs at once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Understandable. <laughs> All right. Harlem Hale says, when being cast, what made each of the casts stick out? When being cast. Well, that's that really a good. question for Mama and Shanky. Yep. Yeah, we saying. decided to cast <laughs> on this. We are the ones that I, we are both co-producers of this and we run the auditions for this. So uh, I'll say for for Callum Dale, uh, he was good at uh, behind the scenes. This was stuff the viewers never got to see mm -hmm. uh, when they were planning out. Uh, one of their, their second scene, uh, he had the Google map. He had where the, he had it marked where the exits of the buildings were. He had it marked about, you know, how you could get in and out. He had all the tactical down. planning of it. Mm -hmm. And a very important thing that a lot of people don't take into account when casting for a stream, uh, very courteous about, you know, if he's talking and somebody else, him and somebody else start talking at the same time, he stops immediately and go ahead. Uh, that is very fucking important. Mm -hmm. uh, you need players that, will work that dynamic because yeah. you're not in the room together. Dale was brand new to the community and 
yeah. brand new to playing with us. And so we didn't know what to expect the first time he showed up in an audition. Um, I'm pretty much brand new to World of Darkness. Yeah, that too. <laughs> so. and, yeah. And, and so basically just all around brand new. But yeah, and, and it was interesting because the, fir the first audition rounds that we do is always more of a tech check and it's a pure improv scene. And we do not heavily judge like role play and stuff during that because not everyone is exceptionally skilled at pure improv. Um, some people need some prep to really get in the headspace of a character. Um, so it's okay. We we don't really judge that. But in the first scene, in the first session, that's where we noticed that Dale was very courteous to his fellow players, that he was a great collaborative player. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't standoffish and just withdrawn he engaged and participated in the scenes but also shared the space very well and then when seeing how he collaborated with his group for the second round where it is more prep and you get to actually go in and play out characters that you're more comfortable with it was great to see him be very collaborative with his group and we had played we hadn't played with re before but we'd seen replay before mm -hmm. uh, dale was completely unknown to us in, in terms of playing ability. So you get the first round, we're like, okay, that's pretty good. Let's see how he does next round. Yeah. And then the next round come up, oh, damn, that was damn good. Okay, let's see how he does this next round. Yeah. And all the way through the auditions, that's because he was through. an unknown to us. Assistant. Same as was, uh, Red was, was, was in the really first. Fun. Yeah. Or in Windy City. Same we did with Red. Oh, that was good. Let's see how they do in the next round. And mm -hmm. all the way through. Mm -hmm. Just consistent. And it was really good. And with Re, it was truly versatility. And that, knowledge. And knowledge. Holy crap. <laughs> uh, Re, I will say, has the ability to pick up on some of the smallest hints I drop. Fuck yeah. And he'll comment on them. Yeah. Or he'll catch an angle that I didn't expect the players to catch when something happens. Mm -hmm. he'll, he'll, he'll catch an angle that I didn't expect y'all to realize. And it's like, okay, there's somebody who knows World of Darkness, knows the game, knows uh, the machinations of the game, which is important. You need yeah. at least a couple players that know the machinations and how convoluted shit can get. And at every turn, Re was ready with that info. Yeah. Big so, time. yeah. And I mean, Dan Thanks. is just Mr. Charm. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> We've played a number of games with Dan. <laughs> we played so much with Dan. We're like, we know he's going to bring all the charisma, yep. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and Red, who's not here, I will say, for Red, we played Windy City with her, but she was in ha uh, half the Chronicle, not the whole thing. Right. And we even said during Windy City, outside of game, behind the scenes, co-producers talking to each other, we would love to see what she could do from the start of a Chronicle. Rather than jumping in one that's already established mm -hmm. with established characters, established storylines, yeah. we wanted to see what she could bring. Because she was amazing in Windy City coming in mm -hmm. midway and picking up and just running with it. And that's hard to do. And that is hard to do. A lot of players, even veteran players, struggle with that um, because you're having to get used to a, a table that has a dynamic and has an established protocol and pecking order. And a uh, storyline's already in progress that you've yeah. got to try to find a way to be part of. And integrate into. Yeah. And, and yeah. she navigated that like a fucking professional. Yeah. So seeing her do that, we both were like, we really want to see what she can bring to a chronicle. It was kind of a shoe in that if she applied for this one, she was in because we really wanted to see what she could do. Unless and, she really fucked up an audition somehow. Right, unless but, she really fucked up an audition, which she didn't. She brought it every fucking yep. time. So. I, I will say for a group that only few of us have played together in, in a, I'll say a long-standing game. Mm -hmm. um, certainly growing pains, you know, learning people's cadences, but uh, I'm very happy with how this group gelled pretty Fuck early yeah. on. Fuck yeah. There's still the in-game, not out-of-game, in-game, there's still those growing pains that you expect to oh. see from a new coterie. Right. Uh, feeling out each other, feeling out the characters. started off as pretty much stranger. Right. Uh, yeah. But out of game, uh, a lot of collaboration, a lot of talk behind the scenes. I do like what I see at the table. There's not, uh, it's real c casual kind of, you know, kind of feel behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. and, Even and when understanding I'm, and understanding like when to push each other's buttons or, mm -hmm. or play off like, Hey, my character is probably not a fan of this. It's going to come up heads up. Like hey, it's not, not a you thing. Let's it's a do character. it. Let's you do it. it. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Like Callum uh, having to to do uh or no uh cat after Callum 
did the uh, I'm being the the dad. I'm doing the dad vibes to to Gwen, which you know was a great scene between those two. Yeah, we you know explaining to Gwen. Then uh, two episodes later, here comes Cat coming in on uh, on Callum doing the same thing. I'm like, okay, I love that <laughs> dynamic. That's, you know that. <laughs> Well, she is yeah, older and more experienced knew. than I am. So yeah, yeah, Kat is, but you know. <laughs> and I love Gwen's playing that naive kind of. She's not. She's sneaky. She's Most manipulative, terrifying. but she's also naive at the same time. Mm -hmm. And she needs once in a while somebody to go look, Gwen. You need to understand this is you know. You need to take take this in a different way than you are because this is the reality of the world. Mm -hmm. huh. All right. I'm going to pause real quick because Astral had a bunch of questions. So it, does anyone at the table have any questions to ask before I move on to viewer questions? Uh, still mulling. Okay. Um, are there any decisions that now that you've made them that you would like, do you wish you could undo? Inviting Becky to the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Newbie Hindsight social character mistake. I'm just saying. <laughs> but it was good story. It was it was good story. And, and it was a good lesson of, for Callum as a character. Lesson. In Chicago, yeah. almost nobody would do something as avert as just burning down a restaurant. That didn't happen right. in Chicago. That right. was not acceptable. Here, mm, you got to, you know, any kind of visible business is going to be difficult to deal with. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rashad's law office is a visible business too. So, you know, I'm sure your office is safe, Rashad. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing that came to mind was like helping, staying and helping Rashad and Callum in that last fight. But the more I dwell on it, like, Bo is not made to be in a crowd. Like, he is squishy. He trusted that the two of them had each other's back. He was on the car that was moving and got off the moving car. So it's like he thought he was more... He was both going to be safer and more useful elsewhere where they had each other's back. So, no. I mean, again, the outcome being what it was, he feels guilty as hell. But I don't think I regret making that decision. <sighs> Honestly, I'm going to say no, because even decisions that may have seemed not great in the moment were true to character. Mm. And honestly, Kat is very flawed. She's very flawed. She is a very fucking fucked up character. Um, so, yeah, she's going to make bad choices at times. But it's definitely something that I feel like each one presented opportunity for great story. Um, so it's worth it to me to play a character that isn't always perfect, you know? So. No regrets for me. <clears throat> That's all. There, there's a lot of scenes that I look back in them and, and feel like it would have been um, more... But this is just learning to play online and yeah. playing the game and interacting with everyone. I feel like it would have added something to the uh, to the scene if when Callum was getting the shit kicked out of him, if he would have like gone down on a knee and looked up at that dude and just kind of chuckled, knowing that Gwen was right there, <laughs> just kind of laughed at him. <laughs> and how about you, Re? Yeah. Um, so I like ultimately how everything turned out, but there is not a regret, not a regret for me as the player, but there have been several scenes where Rashad has regretted not being better at necromancy. Now, of course, he knows he has he still fully agrees with the decision, but there are it's he's very much struggling with the dealing with the real world repercussions of that decision. And that what I would say that would be his regret this is his difficulties. I mean, the biggest thing Kat regrets is coming to Kansas City. <laughs> Go ahead and leave, Kat. Try to leave. No, now she can't. <laughs> yeah, that's like her biggest regret is like she never should have fucking come here. <laughs> oh, I have one regret. 
<laughs> I only sent, there was only like four people, five people in that pack. I should have sent more. Yeah, you should have. <laughs> yeah, you should have. But yeah. Okay, so now we got Astral. What's the most intriguing or interesting plot thread each of the cast wishes to pursue further? Let me make notes here. <laughs> well, I'm I'm gonna go ahead and put myself out there. I wanna know who these elder kindred are in, in the city. I <laughs> we already know one. To, 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 <laughs> to I wanna poke at this at this rat's nest. I wanna keep messing with the with all of the supernatural and occult things. I uh, although those are probably good as luck killed, so you know. Never broken, now united. The Trinity comes. Third verse of one of the premonitions. No. Or in that no. case, it was the no. one told by Twitch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how all this is. It's the sis- sisters of cacophony. Yes. Daughters, daughters, of, daughters, daughters of cacophony. Daughters, yeah. da- daughters of cacophony. How all that works out with Bo. Yeah. <laughs> Cat trying to yeah. elbow not to fuck with them. I can tell you poorly. <laughs> I was debating saying that, but then I'm like, I almost got ash, so I'm less I'm less I'm less intrigued by that. Uh still interested, but less intrigued. Uh I'm not interested or intrigued in pursuing my brother, my mother, and my missing father, but I know I have to. Mm-hmm. Like I like that just sounds awful to Bo, like having to deal with all of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I'll say pursuing the work he wants to do with Otto on his next power induced food venture and how that could maybe help the position of the coterie once fully going. I think I I would definitely like to pursue that uh, circulus, circulatory system complement to what Bo's going to be doing in the kitchen to, like, elevate the dining experience. I mean, I, Kat just wants to survive the fucking war. Yeah. <laughs> The war is not, not that's not interesting thing. or again, it's something we have to do. It's not <laughs> No, what really interests her is killing her fucking brother. <laughs> that's, the, that's the broccoli, not the steak. <laughs> yeah, no, Rurik is going to die, even if she has to go with him, okay? <laughs> yeah, a lot, of, a lot of dead brothers coming. A lot of dead brothers. The dead brothers storylines are really intriguing for me as a player. It's like, yes, let's play out this fucking bullshit family drama. <laughs> Especially if, in fact, uh, Bo's brother is a thin blood. Oh, God, he's lunch. <laughs> you say that. Oh, yeah, I say that. <laughs> but thin bloods can be a threat just because you haven't found one that's a threat yet. Doesn't, no. They I, can be. Still lunch. <laughs> <laughs> the da- most dangerous part of a thin blood, uh, especially one run by the storyteller, is you never know what powers they actually will have because they can do shit that Kindred can't. And Kindred can do shit that Thin Bloods can't. That's true. But <laughs> Kindred are generally predictable, especially by somebody like Grant. He's studied them. He's been experimenting on them. He knows a lot about what they can do. You don't know what he's... Well, you know he's capable of anything because he's a bastard. Uh, you just don't know the limits yet. Uh, will he die? Probably because even one one Thin Blood, no matter what cool shit he comes up with, can't take on five Kindred. You just can't. But... It's a matter of what he does in the meantime, you know? Yeah. I'm also excited to meet more cousins in the, the Star Valley and see yeah. how, how that goes. Yeah, hey, we'll be big happy family. We'll be discussing that between seasons. Yeah, sure. actually, yeah, that that whole thing coming up with dealing with your first <laughs> cousin that we've met. That's gonna be fun. <laughs> that's gonna be fun. Because that's going to require, like, really thinking it through and plotting it out and figuring out what our steps are and what our tactics are going to be. That's going to be fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because no it's not like we like can just family. roll up in there and fucking go to town in his library. 
you know, we got right. we got to plot this shit. And if you spook him, good He's luck finding hide. him. He's going to hide. Yeah, good luck finding him after that. Right. Uh-huh. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it's it, it that's going to be fun too. There's a lot of little story threads in this chronicle that are just going to be fun to explore. They're dangerous, right. but this is a very high stakes chronicle. So, you know, that's just the nature of it. But yeah, there's a lot of fun things. Um, Kovey asks, what's your favorite catchphrase or inside joke from the season? <laughs> I don't know if we have a lot of catchphrases, unless I'm misremembering. No, but, but there's there's like your whole garlic thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and that, right. That, that hasn't. That, I think that's come up more behind the scenes than actually yes. on. Uh, I'll, I'll say Bo's horniness for werewolves. Oh my god, that's fucking hilarious! <laughs> so thirsty. Gwen so mentioning thirsty for danger. Gwen mentioning kidnapping every chance she gets. <laughs> yeah, that's, she that's does that something. as you know, poking fun at me. She yeah, mentions it she every had chance. Kidnap multiple fucking times. <laughs> Don't be so kidnappable then. Like Gwen just has a kidnap bag by the door. Yeah, she just grabs. <laughs> yeah. Some people have bug out bags. She has a kidnap bag. It's okay. Yeah. Gwen has a go bag. Rashad has a ghost bag. We're all set. <laughs> what do you need? Bo has a werewolf date night bag. <laughs> <laughs> It's just some hair clippers. <laughs> a nail file. Yeah. <laughs> he likes scratches, just not that deep. Yeah. <laughs> Let's blunt those off just a little bit. <laughs> no, that's that's corks from the wine cellar. He just puts them on the claw on the tips of the claws. <laughs> They're claw caps. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God, that's too. Uh, oh, my God. Bo and his fucking thing for the world is just so hilarious. <laughs> um, to be fair, no one else said they wouldn't. So. I, no, no. But you're just <laughs> the one blatantly saying you would. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In the privacy of our yeah. our domain or vehicle. <laughs> Um, it's very Toreador. It is. It really is. <laughs> Gotta live up to the name a little bit. There is a catchphrase in this group. There is one. Rashad. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> It'll be fucking fine. It'll be fine. Oh my God. Every time I hear that, I think, no, it's not. It's no, it's word, really word not. <laughs> There is a catchphrase. Rashad has already oh, coined it. I also refer to to lot. my mother as being like a ghost yo-yo, a boomerang, like things that repeat, come back. You know, she's a tool. Yeah. <laughs> now, cat getting called honey for her honey badger. That was fucking hilarious, and her calling uh, Johnny Hawk for ham hawk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for the running joke to be uh, involving Callum uh, inviting people places, but I, he might have learned his lesson and only going to do it once a chronicle. We'll see. But, Maybe. you know, <laughs> next time I'll invite him and I'll blow the place up myself. Now, see, that's smart. <laughs> Please don't. Astral asks players speculation as to what's going on with Manuel. Ooh, I have such, oh. I have such ideas. Wait a minute, I have some speculation. Never mind, I don't need to say. I, I have such ideas. I, I legit think that his child is actually his sire and is managing him. Like there was a mistake or something off in the embrace? No, that basically the way, the way Malkavianism manifested in him she because there's no way she could do what she's doing if she wasn't more powerful than him mm. for those not as familiar uh using any kind of dominate power on somebody who is more powerful than you uh, higher generation or lower generation technically but higher lower number higher in the chart uh 
they just spend the willpower and they ignore you. They ignore it. Yeah, it just doesn't happen. Now, it is they don't have to spend the willpower. It is a voluntary thing, but there you can't tell me if he didn't want her to be able to do it. He he wouldn't allow it. If he yeah, he wouldn't allow it. But so that's why I think as a player. And even cats like mm, that ain't adding up. But um, she's Kaitif. No, she's not. She's wearing symbology of her fucking clan. And she is, and she is managing the prince as the sensual. She's the power behind the throne. Why wouldn't she I just see power? Think because she's a Malkavian. I think they you. do weird ass shit all the time. <laughs> I think that the president is being controlled by an elder and the dominate is just barely holding it off, which is why he's letting it happen. You know. The the what's I forget what's it what's it called for the Malkavians? The Demontation? No, no, the, the connection they have the with web. all the other ones. No, yes. I, I think I think Malkav Malkav is gonna be the third elder. It's the eldest and Malkav underneath the city. And it's all good. It's God, that city's fucked. If it's Samitsi and Malkav under uh, the city, that city's fucked. Well, no, it's fine. It's fine. No, it'll be fine. It's fine. Nothing Sim- to worry about. See, Sumitsi, it'll be fine. Malkav, yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> Third one, Relin had a uh, Relin had a theory on that one too. Oh yeah, because she had told me her theory about. <clears throat> we'll get into that after this question, actually. Yeah. Does anybody else have ideas on Manuel? No, your yours was pretty convincing. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Relin had told me. I don't know if she remembers. She told me she had a theory about what might have caused the issue with blood bonding. Mm-hmm. So share that with the viewers. I don't even think you've shared it with the players. If you remember it, I remember what you said. An ancient Tremere. Tried to blood bond the entire fucking city. And the eldest fucking around with ley lines fucked it up. Because the Mitzi and Tremere do not get along. The ley line you just can't cross. You know? <laughs> the Tremere and no one really get along. And know? notice there's almost no Tremere in this fucking city. They were lunch. Awesome. And I will be fair. If one of the, if we're talking Methuselah to antediluvian level, uh, they have powers you just can't imagine. Be right. fair. Right. If one They're of them not. tried to mass blood bond the city through a ritual of some kind and it went wrong. Bad shit would happen. Oh, yeah. The backlash would be frightening. Yeah. Like an entire city all the way to the outskirts where you can't fucking bond without making people go mad or you can't embrace without making them go mad. And I'll be fair, her theory uh, would explain why new people to the city seem to not be under the problem of it because they weren't there when the fucking shit went wrong. Right. It's a good Since theory. I'm not it's saying it's sharing. true, but it is a good theory. I like the theories. theories. I'm great about theories. <laughs> since, since we're sharing theories, I, I have a similar one. So bear with me here. Uh, I think the elder Malkavian is either Venice Vestinia. I forget how to pronounce her name. But the, the Sabat Malkavian that can break blood bonds. And I think her madness is what's fucking with everybody. That's a good theory, too. Mm-hmm. You know, the Book of the Grave War was written by Malkavian. And that particular book breaks bonds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was written by a Malkavian and, find out. A Malkavian and a Tremere wrote that book together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm sorry. Methuselahs are not impressive to me because there's a motherfucking antediluvian under the fucking city. <laughs> The only way, <laughs> only way a Methuselah is a real threat to an antediluvian is if they are close to each other in sheer age. So it would have to be a very, very old set of Methuselahs under the city to. And Tremere just aren't that old. Uh, yeah, but Tremere broke those rules in particular sure. because uh, they came into, yes, they're young as a clan, uh, but Tremere also himself had salutes memories he just didn't know it at the time 
And he came into it with a, a lot of knowledge of magic from outside, from his mortal life that he brought in that most didn't. So, yeah. Tremere and Methuselahs are dangerous, too. Yeah. But, yeah. All right. Astral asks, what are the most daunting or difficult choices your characters are facing going into season three? I'll go first with that. The most daunting and difficult for Kat is moving forward without her family at her side. She has been inseparable from them longer than she's been kindred. She became a kindred protecting them. They are so closely tied to her humanity that it's going to be very difficult for her to navigate an existence without them nearby. And it's not that, and I did take the alternate clan bane for her. She doesn't have to be surrounded by things she considers hers. It's not, no, oh, I took the alternate clan bane for her. So it's not going to affect her ability to be able to recover willpower and shit like that. But it's definitely story-wise for her, it's going to be a big challenge. I'll go next. Um, for Rashad, it's definitely learning oblivion. Um, uh, for Rashad, uh, he's hinted at it in in some of the episodes, but he is t- he is afraid of the monster that one becomes when relying on that power. But he also fully accepts that he isn't going to be able to to fight a war while holding himself back. And he and there's a part of it that calls to him, and he's afraid he'll enjoy it too much. So we'll see how it goes. With what Bo has learned from Rashad about wraiths and fetters, it has become increasingly more difficult the idea of killing his brother with the assumption that he too is his mother's fetter. You're the one who gave me that that storyline to you know oh, initially yeah. to play with, and boy, am yeah. I turning the screws with that? Oh yeah, bitch. yeah. I mean, not only, again, not only is she a ghost yo-yo, she's also, you know, my my dipshit brother is also a fetter. Cool. And, you know, the only reason I did that is I knew you, you played Wraith. You know Wraith. Oh, yeah. Oh, so it yeah. works to do it with you. It worked to do it with Relin because you both played yeah. in Wraith. So you understand right. the magnitude of the story. Well, I have no problem as a player. It just, right. yeah, it's, it, it's a, right now, circumstances being what they are, Bo's ignorance about wraiths still would probably make it easier for him to just, you know, off his brother if the chance presents itself. But it's still more difficult than it would have been had this not been the case, presumably. Callum? Uh, Callum is struggling a little bit to figure out his place in this new city now like he was expecting to come from chicago start a new restaurant just kind of regenerate what he had going there and uh you know build up his information network and all of that and now he's re-examining what it means to be in a city that's like in a state of war yeah so yeah because that's a new experience for anyone and mm-hmm. that was based in Chicago. Yeah. Chicago has been a bastion of the Camarilla. Yeah. And they had yeah. wars, but not... Not like that. Overt right. things just didn't happen. No. Yeah, it like was that. almost like a, a code. Right. That, well, like the cam just kept a tight people... leash on it. Otherwise, you get Archons and Justicars to show up. Yeah, and even yeah. the Sabbat didn't want a whole bunch of Justicars and Archons showing up because even the Sabbat... Because it's basically the Camarilla capital of North America. Yeah. Now, when the name Lucinda is batted around, even the Sabat goes, oh, wait, wait a minute. A minute. <laughs> is Tally around? Unless Tally's around, we don't we want don't her want here. Her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, it's it's definitely I, I love that we're seeing, especially with Callum, that this feeling like a fish out of water a bit mm. because he really is. He has been kind of sheltered in Chicago and now he's in an active war zone. Right. And, and then, it, that's a big shift. And just like the disregard, that last battle, the disregard that the Sabbat have for Kine, mm-hmm. you know, 
Yeah. <clears throat> and just as a, you know, like one of the first things we talked about before we went into that battle was don't be a hero. Don't do anything stupid. Don't be a fucking hero. And Survive as soon as I saw all these night. people getting just destroyed, um, I think I, like uh, Rashad, felt like we couldn't just stand by and watch that or just turn our backs on it. So. Yep, but that is a risky fucking choice because if you go down, you can't let you can't survive to fight another night. So ultimately, yeah, yeah, saving kind is great. That's humane. But ultimately, if you don't survive it, what good did it do you? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it boils down to. Yeah, there will be times where you have to make the decision is the risk of your death worth worth what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And it might mm -hmm. involve saving some kind, but you know, right. you got to make sure that's what you planned for that night. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, no, I I love that because, yeah, it, it is definitely, you know, Kat's trying to really drive home. We've got to work together to survive this. The ultimate goal is to survive this. That's what she's trying to drive home to everybody. Sure. And she's not the best at fucking communicating it. She knows it. Mm -hmm. And it, she's struggling so fucking hard to make this a cohesive fucking team so that we can goddamn survive. <laughs> well, even if you lose the war, uh, even if you lose the war, Just survive it. if you survive, <laughs> Manuel survived in the city before the war, right. even though Sabat ran the whole city then. Uh, mm -hmm. Survival means you have time later on to try to take it back if you lose. Right. But if you're dead, well, it's over for you. You're right. you're done. You're That's off the board. Shit. That chess game mm -hmm. is over. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think the other thing that Callum is struggling with is realizing that all those stories his father told him when he was growing up. Are true. Werewolves are real. Ra these Ghosts are real. Ghosts. <laughs> like, <laughs> Fairies are, are real. All those stories real? <laughs> Fairies are real. Mages yeah. are real. <laughs> yeah. Some of your worst nightmares are real. real. Right. Yeah. 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 No, it's great. Okay. Uh, Harlem Hale asks, each of the cast's opinion is the safety of Kat's family guaranteed in season three? I'm going to answer. Well, I'll let the cast answer first. I was saying, I... I, I don't think any of them are going to come to severe harm within this next season. I think what Kat has arranged uh, will keep them, and especially um, being that they're not near Kat, they're not uh, not not going to be a direct token for them to be used as as pawns against against Cat. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think narratively, I think. For season three, at least, they are, they'll be safe. Any other commentary before I explain it? Uh, I'll go. Uh, I, the player, think they're going to die 100%. <laughs> um, and they're going to get turned into wraiths. And uh, Rossellini is going to get them. Just whatever, like the worst possible combination of events, really, is what's going to happen. Um, uh, Rashad is more concerned, is less concerned with them dying and more concerned with the necromancer getting them because, as Rashad has been trying to stress to everyone, there are far worse things than death. You know, you're too, everyone's too concerned about survival. I think, um, me as a player, I feel like that is going to be entirely up to the whim of the storyteller. And I'm curious to see how that plays out. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to tell you the whole motivation for it was because I thought I, I, as a player, I looked at this situation as it played out over season two with Kat and her brother. I'm going to be real. Kat doesn't give a flying fuck about Becky. OK, she's just a fucking Zantosa that just luckily for goddamn survived wars. OK, that's all. But her brother is the real fucking threat. Not because it's her brother, because his br because her brother works for her grandmother, who is the real fucking threat. And. Her brother, the few times that he's done things or been present has done little acts like um, flesh crafting humans 
to look like the males of her coterie, but be missing their genitals. Hinting that basically, you know, the guys she's hanging with lack the cojones and she needs to come on back home. Then she sent, then he sent a lookalike with a war ghoul to show her what she could do if she came back home. He's aggressively trying to recruit her. And she knew damn well that if her family was around and Rurik got wind of that, that he would use them against her to isolate her and make her desperate. He's gone after them before in Session Zero. Now, I will say, Rev Nurse Archon has been given specific instructions on quite a bit of this that I'm not revealing. I'm not going to spoil it. Mm-hmm. That's part of that storyline. This is just from my uh, player knowledge and seeing how things have been playing out. But Mama, as a player, was smart at picking Martin as her mala. Fuck uh, yes. Yeah, in the was. Shanky verse, <laughs> Martin is the Nosferatu favor broker, and he doesn't care about sex. He's never cared about sex. He's he was independent. he was active in New York. Uh, matter of fact, he brokered deals to have the Sabbat attack the cam to get a child, Destiny. That uh, my character helped him out with. Yep. He he's owed favors across the US because he's traveled extensively. Uh of all the people to send him to or send her family to, Martin is Martin is the one that grandma will be the least <clears throat> she's least likely to. Cross. Uh, to cross because she owes him a lot of favors, not just her, but a lot of other people owe him favors. And all he has to do is call in a few of them and things get very difficult for her. Now, that does not mean her family's safe. Right. Uh, there are situations where even Martin, as we've shown, Maulers, they try to do what's right by you. That's why they're the Mala. But sometimes Maulers are in, sit- are in positions where they have no choice but to betray uh, the ones the they protege. owe the protege. Yeah, it, it happens. Uh, but but I uh, say, are they immediately safe in the short term? Yes, in the short term they are safe. And in the long term, and that is no one's safe. Basically, what Cat is hoping for that this war can come to its conclusion as quickly as fucking possible, and it's safe for them to come back home. But that's that's her hope, and hope is a dangerous thing in vampire. But literally, she specifically worded it as, "I want them under your protection." There's long term, there's a lot of ways that her family could be brought back to Kansas or threatened in another place. There's mm-hmm. a lot of ways. Oh, yeah. And but, she knows, and Kat knows it. But, but in the short term, it'll take a while for, for people to even figure out where her family went. Right. They just disappeared. Yeah. That'll take a little while to lock down, too. So, yeah, it's a great short term plan. Mm-hmm. But no one is safe long term. That's just how this is. And her husband is actually a touchstone. So getting him out of the city helps protect her humanity. So there's that. Yeah, it's a good question. All right. So it looks like things have settled down a little bit with the chat questions. I'm going to post again to use your channel points to highlight your messages if you have questions, because if they are just typed out with no highlight, I'm going to miss them. <laughs> Keep them coming. Keep them coming, y'all. Okay, my question. Uh, theories on the premonitions at the end. Come on, let me hear. Mom was like, as soon as the stream was over, by the way, mom was like, that's why I don't take premonition. I fucking hate the riddles. Yeah. I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and of the two you were told, which one do you think is the more important one? The one Twitch said? or? The modified version of the second coming. I honestly think the most important one is what Twitch said, because NPCs are always incredibly valuable in any Shanky Chronicle. You need to pay attention to every fucking word that comes out of their mouth because he is dropping important information on you with every NPC. Um, Literally, that's my opinion of it. And it's also knowing what I know about the character of Twitch. He doesn't have premonition. He reports 
what he sees and hears and witnesses. That's what he does. He's a chronicler. His strength is in the web. And it's in the web. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So basically, he's reporting what he's getting that's happening. And that's important. Which would actually go back to what Rashad had said. If Malkavia, if Malkav is one of them in the city, Twitch is very strong in the Malkavian web. Eh. At what point is what Twitch saying his, or is it what he's being fed through the web through Malkav himself? If it's Malkav in the city, or even a very powerful Malkavian in the city. I I do not share the same dislike for for premonition. I I love this. This is this is exciting. Uh, but I don't. I think they're all. But I think both of them are pretty equally important. Uh, and it can. I mean, they can all be interpreted in so many ways. You know, uh, we could be dealing with the clan of death, and since the, with the theme of trios, and uh, not a lot of people know this, but the Cappadocians were associated with being able to see the future and and prophecy and all that as well. So we could we could also be dealing with an elder Cappadocian beneath the city, which would also be fun. So who knows? It's always exciting and it'll all be just fine. Callum gave a whole breakdown to the cast separately. <laughs> I'm gonna not gonna post that here, but he gave a whole breakdown where he analyzed the entire premonition line by line. Uh, some good thoughts on that. I gotta give it to him. I'm not gonna say whether he's right or not, but some good <laughs> thoughts on that. Bo just wishes the radio station in his head would change. You know, speaking of you, Bo, with premonitions. <laughs> Have you given thought to that premonition you had the night of the Sabbat attack, whether it was actually a premonition or a summoning? That was a summoning. Yeah, no. He, <laughs> but in Bo's, Bo's mind, because it wasn't something like he saw it, 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 was, it was kind of forced upon him. It, yeah, it definitely felt more of a, a calling or a summoning. Because I will say premonitions Especially, can be forced upon you. It happens. They, they just take people sometimes. Right. But going back to Valen about pay attention to what I say, your eyes didn't glaze over. You didn't get right. that far away look. You just it, got I, I just a premonition. I was, I was getting I was getting cacophony tinnitus. Mm -hmm. Um which summonings and, can be uncomfortable if you try if you resist them in any way. Now a lot of times when you when somebody uses if they use the power of summoning on you, you can tell who summoned you. Uh, if you read the power, that's what it says. Uh, but if somebody's very subtle or very powerful with it, who's to say you would actually know who was summoning? Or in the case of the daughters, if they were all working together, the two daughters with Mr. Tenor, who actually was summoning you? There's not a person. It's a group. Uh, you wouldn't be able to tell as much. It's reinforced that with the fact that they weren't expecting us there either. Like the, the Sabat wasn't expecting us to be there either. Well, then why did they want, why did the daughters want you there? I'd go nuts thinking about that too much. <laughs> Just things to think about. Just oh, go yeah. forward. Last time I, I paid attention too closely, I almost turned into ash, so. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> My own fault. Knowledge. Well, the it was the dice's fault, but. How much are the players speculating they will have to rely on the support of the werewolves? Hopefully a lot. Honestly, <laughs> I'm going to be real. Um, Kat is networking like a mofo with those that are capable and fucking powerful and fucking blunt. OK, um, because that is how she relates. And, and, and she knows that the Sabbat don't really have allies. Nobody likes the fucking Sabbat. And the Sabbat fucks everybody over. So literally, they have no allies. So Kat's working on getting some fucking allies to go against the Sabbat. But this is a shanky game, so don't expect the werewolves to be able to solve the problems for yeah. them. I've already got things in place that I'm planning to use to make sure that that doesn't happen. Right. No, it's not that Kat is actually expecting werewolves to solve the problem, even though they probably fucking could. Um, they're not interested in solving the fucking problem. This is vampire bullshit. Um, There's also I, other issues. I think 
I think there are opportunities to find maybe indirect problems that we're facing. Right. Like we'll face we'll face the direct problems. Right. Maybe the indirect problems that are also in their interest that we could get them exactly. to step they in. They will on. be useful at times. At times. Situationally. Right. Useful. Sometimes right. they won't be very useful and sometimes they may even be a hit. A hindrance. A hindrance, right. right. They have yeah. their own agendas. Yeah, it's basically, Cat is creating situationally useful allies, basically. Um, yeah. That, you know, a little quid pro quo type situation with these folks. Um, and literally, I see that it won't just be vampires and werewolves working through this. It's going to be vampires, werewolves, mages, even wraiths working on this shit because the city is fucked up. Now. For those that are familiar with Windy City, uh, just think about how mages can be double-edged swords. Mm -hmm. Cameron being an awakened. Dangerous. Uh, it's not going to be all positive coming from that. You can rest assured. Oh, yeah. That's why I still think Gwen needs to turn them, but that's just me. Take him to the outskirts of the city. Put a few fangs in his neck. And take his magic from him forever. Yep. Before he even knows what it is. That, that Well, yeah, that's that's a thing. It's can you miss something that you don't really know you have? If she takes it from him after he's gotten it, he'll hate her forever. Right. Take it before he knows what the I fuck know. it is. All I know for sure is that he can't fight. We are not going to be very good at fighting the the fancy Simiti ghouls. So the werewolves can handle those. That'd be great. But there's ways you can deal with a war without directly fighting. Intel is important. Well, and that's the thing. That's that's part of why Bo is pushing some of the stuff he is with, like, I'll say his artistic ventures is like, if he can hobnob with influential people and and get them interested in his work, like, then Callum can do his venture thing with them and hopefully build allies that way. Like, no, Bo is not a blunt person and like cat is being blunt with the people she needs to be blunt with to make allies that way mm -hmm. like we it's have a not very been able niche to, thing she's doing <laughs> information we have not been able we have not been able to set roots in kansas city long enough to make allies the way callum and i would normally make our, our right. best at making allies yeah. information <laughs> is the is the one of the best right. weapons you'll have and that's and we're trying to get there but time is not our time is not our ally it won't be as Relin has pointed out many times in the Shanky game, uh, you never have time to concentrate on everything going on. Nope. Uh, nope. It is always a lot of things in the background looming that you have to try to figure out how to juggle because right. without that kind of pressure, it's kind of, it loses stakes. It becomes very laissez-faire. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> it's not a question. It's a question of how you react to what's happening now. While being somehow able to make plans for what's going to happen in the future. And although, that's what makes it. Big. Although the Sabat totally fucked themselves in that process, too. Because now the feds are coming. Yep. The Sabat were never known to think about that. They don't care. Yeah. Well, they they should care because they're going to come for them, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. They fucked themselves with that. It's going to be a thing. Mm hmm. Yeah. It'll all be fine. <laughs> there it is again. It'll all be fine. <laughs> and Shaggy, you remind me that I, I hadn't posted it yet, but I did a, a breakdown of that first short poem as well. Oh, I, you did? I, 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 I put it in the cast area for mm. everyone. We'll see how that one goes. I'll read that after the, the stream. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that one. We'll see that one. I know what it means, but. It's one of those rare cases where I know way ahead of time what something means. Red was right when she said in, in chat during the stream, uh, you know it's trouble when Shanky did prep work and wrote a premonition out ahead of time. Yeah. That's way too yeah. much effort coming from Shanky. She's right. Just have to keep diving further into aspects and I'll get all the answers. But that, and that's the thing I like about Rashad and Bo's relationship. Both are are both aspects heavy, but use it very differently. Mm -hmm. For fighting a war, one of the best aspects powers is not premonition; it's clairvoyance. Being able to scout a location without leaving the building, being able to be aware of what's going on around you—you you got to get to that point. But clairvoyance is nothing but handy. Mm -hmm. 
that power so bad. I've never gotten to use it in the game before. I really want it. Oh, when uh, Roscoe got it in Windy City, it, the Coterie began to rely on him being able to scout locations using clairvoyance. Fuck yeah. And spirit touch? Oh, fuck. That's, that's what... Uh... <laughs> spirit touch is fucking handy. <laughs> Little little deep dive. Bo is going because of the book of his mother's book that he possesses. That's why Bo is going to be going for that as soon as he can. Mm -hmm. Really useful. useful. It's really fucking useful to get the history of an item to see who touched it, who interacted with it. I think that also ties in with the kindred iconography Mm -hmm. that Bo Bo has. Kindred iconography, I want to say, that's been fun that you've had it. It's allowed me to introduce all kinds of things that otherwise wouldn't have been Mm -hmm. put in there. And it's useful, as me as storyteller, uh, to give hints about things, to to steer things certain ways. It's really useful. And I love that, like, you can pick up Sabbat symbols and stuff, too, because while you don't understand them, you can describe them, and Kat can relay what she recalls of them, you know? Yeah, I can pick it apart a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And given time, you might begin to learn them all on your own, too. But mm-hmm. yeah. in the beginning, some of the symbols, you'll be like, right. I know it's a kindred thing, but I don't know what. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, it's been so good with that lore sheet so far. Mm-hmm. You know, Rashad, you could use your lore sheet to get you a teacher in for your oblivion ceremonies. Uh, I fully plan to, you know, to do. That'll probably be something that I'm doing over the over the break. But, you know, bringing family in makes things more complicated in ways. It does make it more complicated in some ways, but because they all have their own agendas. It's not a happy family. I'm sorry, but don't believe the hype people. Especially when some people have close relations with rates. It's it's very difficult when you have more experienced necromancers around. Yep. Any other cast member have a question before we move to? Any, I don't know if any viewers had yeah, a new no one. Viewers have posted questions. They've been commentating with Come each on, other. Come on, people. You've just got an opportunity here. I was I was trying to lean into Callum's academics philosophy and the whole background with, you know, the, the backstory with Ballard and all of that with the breakdown of those things and maybe generate some conversation either either before live stream or or during live stream uh, philosophy is one that you'll get into probably as you the war progresses mm-hmm. yeah. or as the premonitions start to right you, you know it's a jigsaw puzzle Eric <laughs> yeah it's well it's a jigsaw puzzle you, mm-hmm. you're, we're only on season two we just finished season two uh, you're missing yeah. a lot of pieces. You don't even have the box yet. You don't even know what the picture is going to even close mm-hmm. to what it's going to end up looking like. So <laughs> we we haven't finished putting the edges together. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. And Kat hasn't even manifested her horrid form yet. <laughs> she had the chance. She had the opportunity. No, not in that situation, because we were not going to be the ones breaking the masquerade. <laughs> Already broke it. Yeah, but we weren't going to be the ones breaking it. (laughs) That's why. That's why the coterie's not in fucking trouble. Okay. (laughs) No, you didn't get in trouble. You just told keep your head down, just because all the vampires should keep their head down after an event like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the coterie's not in fucking trouble because we didn't break the masquerade. (laughs) And uh, that is Sabat attack. It highlights something about Manuel's method of of leadership and the way he's running the city. Uh, he didn't really stop the event from happening Mm-mm. because unfortunately that's not how he operates. Cat's made a note. You got to war. He's, he cares about certain things. He has his passions, but overall Manuel is not humane in the traditional sense of the word. You know, uh, he goes to these soup kitchens It's not always because he's really caring about the poor there. It's the emotions he gets while he's helping and and information, information, not just that, but the, the emotions that, cause he, he deals with emotions is his problem. Uh, when he goes to those and he's feeding and helping people, the gratitude, yeah, that's, he only has positive things coming from him for his actions. So he's not, he's just like every other kindred. 
Uh, he has a monstrous side to him that, you know, affects the way he runs things. Yeah, Kat's made a note because literally Christabella is a member of the leadership of the city. And she was well aware that shit was going to go down, obviously reported it up, and nobody tried to stop it. Christabella wouldn't even try to stop it. She thought it was going to be fun to, for a fight. Yeah. She's uh, a bit bloodthirsty, actually. So, yeah, Kat's made a note of how this leadership operates in this city. And she doesn't think any of them are going to survive. There's a callousness to it that's difficult to deal with. <laughs> she doesn't think a single goddamn sword. one of the leadership is going to survive. <laughs> Better hope Manuel's not taken down. Technically, he's the, what's holding the city together. Uh, at least he thinks so in his head. Yeah. It's fine. The Giovanni can take over that part. It's fine. Ye no. Um, Giovanni, that city is fine. I have a question. Sure. What for so for everyone, what are things you would like to see the other character from your character's perspective, see the other coterie members take a step forward and do? Like, what are your aspirations for fellow coterie members this coming season? Well, that's a good one. Yeah. I'll 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 take a stab first. Sure. Um, I, I want to see cat's word form in the worst way. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> uh, I've talked with the storyteller about, I'm like, I think it should be like something like this. Like she doesn't even know what it's going to be. <laughs> right. Um, I, I, I think I want to see Bo's character, you know, manifest this idea that he has with dealing with blood and creating an experience because i think that will lead to some other things as he's making those relationships and making you know bringing that to life um i'm looking forward to see how rashad evolves more into his family's gifts and how quickly he loses humanity on, on that track <laughs> <laughs> He's about to get on the rocket ship. It, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my rouse checks in this game have been tragic. Yeah. Oh yeah, your yeah. rouse checks. Are, <laughs> you, <laughs> you really should never rouse. Tropic. <laughs> yeah. What about Gwen? Gwen, um, I I want to see her build her information gathering network because mm -hmm. that's only going to benefit all of us. Yeah. Yeah, that's my cool. thoughts on all that. You know, I, I'll go next. Why not? Um, yeah, I'm see, still trying Rashad to form 100... the words. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rashad 100% wants to see uh, Gwen become more like the the ministry that he's been told about. Um, <laughs> he see, he's definitely seen it uh, a few times in the way that she's good at manipulating people, but he also acknowledges that uh, she tends to be a little too too emotional in people, especially with this the new human. Uh, he's worried about that. He he would he would like to see everybody to stop being so close to human beings because that that'll hurt you. Uh, and that he really, really needs everybody to to really accept that there are far worse things than death. <laughs> <laughs> they keep talking. Everyone's so worried about survival and, you know, making sure that we make it. Like, no, 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 no. It's okay. Death is okay. You really should be more concerned about what happens after the death. Yeah, that's that why we don't want to die. Okay, death. so right. I will make sure we have some you. specters manifest and run amok at one point, too. So Rashad can really drive home. Drive that home when I have specters monstrosities on the street that are obviously dead creatures manifest. It, it'll be fine. <laughs> right now, the worst thing Bo is seen is being a drone. Like that is the worst. Like so, like he knows, like that's not good. Like so, hopefully, like 
saying there's worse is terrifying, but like he can't grasp that because the worst thing that has happened to him, like and his mother, just happened. I think mine is more pertaining to the coterie working more as a team moving forward, especially in combat situations. Um, I want to see Bo act like he's a fucking head chef. A head chef directs. I want to see Callum act like an actual fucking manager, a general. I want to see Rashad be real support. I want to see Kat actually be a brawler and not trying to take on all the roles of director and fucking general because she is not cut out for that shit. (laughs) She's too blunt and hurts too many fucking feelings. Um, (laughs) Yeah, but that that's like a big one for her. Um, Gwen is already like spot on. She she is the the sneak attack. She she's perfect. Um, But. In, in that situation. But as far as like outside of that, yeah, um, I'd like to, I, I want to see the face characters a little more forward. And I know some of that is both of y'all are new to Vampire. Uh, Callum, Callum, Dale, not Callum, but Dale is getting used to also streaming and playing with new people and stuff like that and getting his fit in the table. So I'm really looking forward to as that comfort level increases, the characters becoming a bit more forward. Um, that that will be fun. That will be really fun. Um, Same with the Torridor. Torridor is a face. Yeah, Torridor is a face. So both the Ventru and the Torridor, both of them are faces. And seeing them come forward a bit more will be fun. Um, I'm definitely fascinated to see how Rashad changes over time. Yeah, he changes by his humanity hits six, then five, then, then four. four. And then and then levels <laughs> out about four. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm really fascinated to see how Gwen comes to terms with her touchstone. Because that is a very complicated situation that she has created for her character. And it's going to be a lot. So seeing how the player navigates that in character is going to be fascinating. And as far as my own character, yeah, I, I'm probably going into season three as in the character headspace as lost as it's, this character has ever been. She didn't present it into se- you know fi- season finale because she's the type that keeps her shit close to the chest. She doesn't like to burden others. But yeah, she's not okay. She has not been okay, and she's really not okay now. So she, yeah, that that it's going to be interesting. And as storyteller, I want to see how this coterie reacts to real danger and real tragedy. So far, they haven't hit really with both. They've they've had fights, but at no point was it real danger and real tragedy. Uh, Within the coterie, I'm assuming you mean. Mm, coterie and what's important to the coterie. Mm-hmm. I mean, the loss of a restaurant was important. I, like, again, I, I I would argue Ghost Mother is pretty, pretty fucking tragic. hard. <laughs> yeah, but that's not the coterie. That's Haunted. that's Bo. Yeah, and that's what that's why I said. That's what I mean. Like within right. the coterie. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That I agree. You know, uh, I don't pre-plan a lot. I let the players drive the story, but as the story plays out, I see paths that the story will go based on events happening. And I've got to say some fucked up shit is coming uh, because of your actions and inactions. It's a combination of both. Uh, There's going to be some fucked up tragic shit that comes down eventually. Uh, That's going to be fun from a story perspective, but rough on the players and, or sorry, on the characters, not the players. 
Oh, it you might know? be a little rough on the players, too. But. It might be. Because <laughs> some of these things get intense. But yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Vampire, as Astral said. Absolutely. You know. Uh, this, ain't, this ain't kittens and unicorns, okay? The Gwen and Cameron story, <laughs> it's important for Gwen, but there's some points where. It's going to overlap into the It's going to overlap into the rest of you because hmm? it's going to. Bad shit can happen. He's that, working for the enemy. That makes it a problem for <laughs> Gwen, which makes it a problem for you in a different way. Uh, because if she's shattered by an event, like completely shattered mm -hmm. by an event. You know, there goes our assassin. Right. Or <laughs> I hate to put it this way. Gwen's a perfect example, though. Uh, it's one that the viewers know about so far. Uh, what if leverage is put on him and her where she has to make choices to choose between a touchstone and her own coterie? Yeah. That impacts you all as a group, not yep. just her, because touchstones are very important. And loyalties are important to a coterie, but there are real consequences for a character when it comes to a touchstone. Why do you think my character sent her touchstone away? Because legit, I know as a player, my character would side on for her touchstone over the coterie any goddamn night. I mean, it's that so touchstones should be that way. That option out of the fucking storyteller's playbook. Uh, that's the point of touchstones. They're supposed to be that important to yeah. you. Uh, and I love to make the ethical choices of uh, you have no good options here. Well, just you have to figure out which of the bad ones you can live with. Well, I, Gwen can be put in some pretty fucked up situations with that. And so can the whole coterie. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the touchstone will let him go to a better place. Well, yeah, but letting let him him touchstone dies rough. That's or what if Cameron is go. put under screws? To you set know, us up. To set the rest of you up to spare Gwen. Right. How how well is his fortitude with that? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of angles. Uh, Bo's mother is a giant fucking crowbar I can use. I admit yeah. that. Yeah. Not just for Bo, but for, for Bo and Rashad. Which means the whole... Yeah. That is already... I mean, even for the enemy. Even for Bo's brother. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, yeah, that goes can to... Can fuck him up, too. <laughs> with the question I asked, like, with Bo, Bo is that, um, or I guess aspiration, isn't that he's going to help Bo. It's that um, he commits to one way or the other. He, just, he doesn't want Rashad doubting what choice he's going to make. Either say, I, I've renounced this. Or I'm going to go all in. And if he goes all in, then Bo is going to put, be maybe a little more assertive about getting his help with his mother's situation. Mm -hmm. But he has no, he sees the burden it's putting on Rashad and he wouldn't expect to take on burden that he doesn't want to. Uh, so I think that's where Bo's aspiration for Rashad is, is when you make a choice, be all in on that choice. Mm -hmm. Callum uh, cares about his people. Mm hmm. Yeah. And and that's where I was going with Callum, uh, kind of touching on what what Mama said is I'm ready to see Callum get his feet on the ground and assert himself as a leader. Yeah. Because, uh, again, very much understand where we are in uncharted waters mm -hmm. right now. But uh, it's going to be it's going to be absolutely wonderful to see Callum right. as a character find his footing and stand his ground. But yeah, but on right. the fucked up shit. What length will Callum go to to protect his people? Yeah. And when the Coterie has to get involved, where's the Coterie's line about what length Callum will go to to protect his people? Because if he's running a restaurant, you're running a visible thing. Uh, your people are targets. Yeah. What will you do to protect them? And what will the Coterie do in response to what, you know, Callum may have to do? Or, you know, how would the Coterie say, look, you know, where's the line the Coterie puts on it? Uh, yeah, it's okay. it's applying pressure to the whole coterie by applying it selectively to individuals in the coterie mm -hmm. because coterie drama is important, but it's it's not just about the drama of those interpersonal conflicts. It's the how does the coterie deal with it? Uh, the thing that makes the vampire players different than most of them in the city is they have a coterie. 
So I love to highlight the fact that you have a coterie, but you're still individuals. But where is that line about what's what's more important, the coterie or your personal things? And where does the coterie draw a line between what the individual will do and the group will do as a whole? And I'm going to put levers to it and I'm going to push that button every chance I get. Yeah, Kat is literally putting her personal shit on fucking hold right now trying to get this coterie together. Because she's not willing to risk her personal interests when we're not cohesive yet. Right. It just with all of us, we have personal shit that are direct antagonists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to, oh, to, she does too. Yeah, yeah everyone right. does. That's, that's why I mean. she's I said, not we, doing we, her we, chin. Yeah, everyone does. Right. Everyone we, we, does. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's why she's not even focusing on her charity right. organization and all that shit right now. Because literally, she's like, no, we, we are not cohesive yet. We can't defend our shit as a team yet. Yeah. I mean, we're already seeing it with Rashad. He's changed one of his core beliefs. He didn't want to do necromancy. But in response to what's going on, pressure's put not just on him, but on other members of the group. A ghost was involved in the restaurant burning. Uh, a ghost was involved in the Sabat attack. Mm -hmm. That pressure is causing Rashad as a character to have to make compromising decisions mm -hmm. that have long-term ramifications. And those are the things that, that's why I love to story tell vampire, because I love to tell the story of uh, every vampires. Every away a piece of Yeah, every, I, that's a common thing I mentioned. Every night that you wake up as a vampire, uh, you'll have to make decisions that are not good. Sometimes you're not happy that you had to make them, but you give away a piece of yourself. And how long before you look in the mirror and you don't recognize who you once were because you've given away so much of yourself because it was either easy or the best choice at the time or Cat you felt you had to do away. it. That was a huge part of her. Yeah. She just gave away. Yeah. Yeah. You, you felt you had to do it because it was the only way forward. Mm -hmm. How long before that takes a toll and you become the monster? Oh, yeah, she, that you didn't want to be. I, I totally see my character losing humanity over the next few seasons. I totally yeah. do. Because she doesn't have, even though her touchstone still exists, they're not close anymore. What's Bo going to do when the Giovanni in the city puts pressure on his mother? That's going to bring some conflict with Rashad, <clears throat> who's reluctant to do these kind of things, but also just issues in general. Because you can't kill yourself. The beast will fight you at every every minute of that. So you kind of get caught where uh, you're a fetter that could be used to control your own mother. Yep. Astral did have a question. He says, now I'm wondering how much that episode where they burned the Sabbat safe house, noticing all those icons along the way might influence the future, their future Sabbat targets. Oh, absolutely. That's intel. Those are potential targets. That's 100%. where players need to, to get the intel and then prioritize targets. Players need to break out context of PIs to, to case the area, to get info. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't do it themselves. It's too obvious. If they'll be noticed. You can be sure most of the Sabat knows what they look like by now. Works made sure of that shit. So, but they can use PIs. They can use other uh, methods to gather intel on those locations. Yep. Uh, you don't want to hit them in a way that, you know, you don't want to give the Sabat a chance to prepare. Right. It's the best way to deal with this is surprise hits, get in, get out, get gone. Right. Like mm -hmm. the safe house. Like the safe house. We got in, we got out. Yeah. Didn't hang around. Mm -mm. Went in there, had a mission, did it, left immediately. Didn't want to, didn't stay to watch people burn. Didn't care about the aftermath. That's not the point of it. The point of it, hit them, show we can do it, leave, get out. Mm -hmm. And they've got, they can use that, those locations to start gathering that intel. Mm-hmm. Now, the mortal PIs won't be able to tell who's a vampire or not, but you can build uh, who's the regulars. Yeah. Because even if they're not Sabat members, uh, regulars are important to any kind of location. They could be blood dolls. They could be ghouls. They could they be could information still, sources for the Sabat. They could be information sources for the Sabat. They could still be fucking valid targets. Or you get you notice these guys are regular, and then you have their, their pictures, and you find them in the rack. So are... Yeah, are they actually regulars there? Or are they gathering intel on you? Right. I mean, this is there's a lot of angles that you can use. You just you got to leverage mortals to do it. Yep. But yeah, no, definitely any places within the Sabat territory that have markings are potential targets, at least for further investigation. To see what's going on there. And the coterie has an advantage. Cat can make 
Coder members look like somebody else, mm -hmm. uh, can make Bo look like anybody. And then Bo can go through the Sabbat territory and start mapping down symbols. Yep. And won't look like him. Won't look like him. Give him a uh, an Uber, get him an Uber account, a new face. He's an Uber driver for a few nights. Yep. For those that don't think about it. Add a few dots in that drive then. Yeah. Uber's a great way to gather intel. Let me tell you. Huh. People talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And it gives you an excuse to be driving over the same parts of the city without drawing attention to the fact because you're an Uber driver. You know, they'll see you in the same area three or four times. You're not casing a joint. You're <laughs> dropping somebody off, picking up another person. You know, it's in a city. It's very inconspicuous. Uber Eats, you know, those kind of things, things to just make you move around the city. Yeah, that's a good good Someone question. The bot has a scry the soul. You know, uh, Bo doesn't have it, but you know, Rashad can do the same thing. You can be made to look yeah. like anybody. Yeah. And that's the nice thing about having a pocket Zamitsi. Yep, and <laughs> it fools cameras. And it fools cameras. You look like somebody different. <laughs> yeah, unlike obfuscate. It'll fool a camera. So there's a lot of things it can do. But you can bet everything I've just said, Sabat's doing already. They didn't know where the Coterie was because the Coterie just changed domains. Right. How long before they know where their new domain is? How long is? before they know? Yep. How long before they know? And what are the NOS really doing in the city? In informing the Sabat. Absolutely. fucking -lutely. They're goddamn traitors. You know, so far the coterie's avoided the NOS. Kill on site to cat uh, now. You've avoided the NOS, but at some point you're going to have to engage them in some ways just mm -hmm. to suss them out. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just a fact. Or, you know, pour gasoline down their fucking drains and goddamn light it on fire. Yeah, that too. <laughs> Burn them out. Burn that them always out. works. Smoke them out. <laughs> fuel, fuel air explosives are a thing. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Manhole explosion. That's all. That's all I'll say. It happens in DC all what the time. Is the element that when it hits water, it explodes. I forget. Is it magnesium? Mag magnesium. Yeah, we'll just drop some magnesium down the storm drains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yep. Any other questions? Let's. You know, we're getting closer to the two hour mark. So, yeah. any other player good player questions? I've got one I'm going to ask in a minute, but I want to make sure everyone else has a chance. If nobody else, here it comes. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead and do yours, Mama. What was a favorite scene for you as a player that you were not in this season? Cat and Cameron's. Or, uh, Gwen and Cameron's. Gwen, Gwen, Gwen and Cameron's. Okay, let's just say everyone loved Gwen and Cameron yeah. scenes. Yeah. Oh, that was just, God. you know, Good. yeah, so heavy, so emotional, just everything. Yeah. Even them coming up with nicknames for each other, a fucking, that was chef's kiss touch there. Mm -hmm. Um, I enjoyed the gambling scene. It been good. <laughs> I kind of wish I was there, but not really. Uh, it was fun to watch. It was a lot of fun. Nice, nice, uh, not mortal danger. That episode. Right? Yeah, it was fun. For me, it was actually the discussion between Callum and Bo after the Sabat attack on the rack. Huh. That was just a very intense scene that you two had together. And it was really enjoyable. To, to just sit and watch that play out. I feel like that's going to continue on for a while, mm -hmm. like a, a oh, yeah. tension or a. Yeah. Oh yeah. That tension is going to be there a little while. You're used right. to working yeah, together in the on. kitchen and in the restaurant, but not outside of that. Not like this. Right. Yeah. Actually, I, I kind of think of it the other way, Shanky. I kind of think of it that, that he and I have always been on the same page in the restaurant, supporting each other. 
And that was a real like jarring uh, realization for him that, you know, maybe outside of that small space, I don't actually know him as well as I thought. Do you ever really know anyone as well? Again, that's a matter of perspective. Like Bo left because because he trusted Callum. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But that's great dynamic. I got to admit, that's great dynamic. It's not that he he didn't feel like he was ditching Callum. He felt like the two of them together had it handled. Mm -hmm. Which highlights the Curtery is a group, but you're also individuals in the group. You all have your own thoughts and your own ways Mm -hmm. of dealing with it. Right. Just like, like Kat I thought y'all should have shot that bitch that was going to kill, uh, that killed uh, Brad and Nicole, or yeah, Nicole. Uh, Kat thought y'all should have shot her immediately. Just fucking as soon as she broke neck, shoot, just open up. Just open up. Yeah. But from your point of view, you, that, you know. That's, that's a distraction. Mm-hmm. Let's not, de- no, fucking stop her from murdering more people, then deal with the others. Right. <laughs> the different, that, that's, that shows that everyone's an individual. You know, yeah. I, I love that. That shows that each vampire has their own thought process. Mm-hmm. And it makes the stream brighter, especially afterwards when you all go, what the hell just happened? Mm-hmm. Like, I think Callum would have understood more if Bo went to help the werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know the werewolf was there. I didn't know the werewolf was there. No, I know. I know. <laughs> shout out for Maddox just standing there the whole time right, leaning against right. the building until I had the creature God, come at him. Shout out to him as a guest player just standing there drilling his fucking thumbs while we're playing. <laughs> And once in a while, arguing with the spirit. Yeah. <laughs> That's fun. That is fun. Hey. What's I, I'm spacing on the the gentleman that was at Elysia, um, not not any of the Sabbat, um, but like kind of maintains the rules of Elysia or like, or just the rules in general. Uh, that when was we, the, the keeper. That was uh Satsuko, but Hideo no, was no, also no. Uh, there. Hideo, Hideo is who I'm thinking of. Yeah. He was also there. I, I'm very, I was very intrigued by Gwen and his interactions or like in her, her interest in him. She's determined to get him to reveal some shit. Right. That is right. A very ministry of her to try to get him. His convictions are that he can't, reveal that right. she's trying to get him to break her conviction which his conviction which is very fucking ministry <laughs> right. to get him to spill info that he doesn't want to give up because it goes right. against everything he does callum's determined from a hospitality angle to get him to you know to build a rapport with him it's gonna be tough yeah he I doesn't like fuck it. he's a goddamn banu and he's up and he's one for hire so fuck it <laughs> He tries not to ever have an emotional stake in anything he's doing. I oh I, I was saying the another one that came to mind was uh when Kat and Bella were together. I don't remember what specific episode, but they were like staking out st- something. Oh yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Um just that interaction kind of two kindred spirits. Oh god, yeah. Bit, yeah, talking. Bella's a bit of a psychopath though. I wouldn't say that cat I don't want to say that Kat's been dishonest, but it felt like that's Bella is someone Cat could be her true self around and not put up a face, not be like flirty, like flirty, like she could just say what's what to Bella. And we got to see that. Yeah. Because in a lot of ways, she can with Bella. Yeah. You know, she doesn't have to hold herself back. And Gwen right. thinking she's going to be uh, pulling the rug on, on Dre. But I got to tell you, Gwen is is good. But. Uh, Dre the Ravnos, mm, she's gonna beat her match if she keeps pushing that one. But I will say Red is argue as the the most natural ministry player I've ever met. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't even consider that at first, really. Yeah. <laughs> she's so good at playing looking innocent and playing innocent when behind the eyes, there's some fucked Terrifying. up shit going in that head where she's planning some shit. For for as mu- as much as I say, like oh, uh, Gwen's the scariest one. Bo has an innate interest in like working with her. Like she's the only one who knows. Bo likes most- dangerous things. Bo is curious. Is it, is <laughs> not. Bo is Bo is 
curious, not to the in the same way that like Gwen as a ministry is, but like uh, he he wants to pull threads. You know, he's he he's he's a button pusher. You're a Tory door. Got it. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Um, but Gwen's the only one who knows the most or knows the most about the daughters of Cacophony and Bo's interactions with them. Gwen was close to opening up about her mother, which I know we're saving that for later, but like not being able to finish that conversation has Bo like, we need to come back around to that. And Gwen and Bo are the youngest vampires among the coterie too. Now I'm going to mention about Gwen's mother. Uh, spoiler, because I haven't done a lot of spoilers. Uh, that's going to be a memoriam episode. Yeah. There will be at some point, whether it's a between season memoriam or even a in season memoriam episode where we're going to do some memoriam scenes for various players at this table, probably between season because memoriams take a lot of effort to get coordinated and get run up because you need a lot of extra people. But the story of Gwen and her mother, uh, that's going to get fully revealed during a memoriam. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I actually have one question, Shanky. Well, I yeah. think, did Reed, did you answer your favorite oh, scene? Yeah, yeah. That oh. you weren't part of? I thought I did. Yeah, um, he did. Oh, well, yeah, gambling. The game. Yeah, was the the game. Oh, that's right. The gambling. The game. I, I apologize. I apologize. Go ahead, Dale. Um, I, I know as the season has gone on, I've thought back to some of those other characters that we played in the auditions and how how it would have been cool. You know, maybe I should have steered in that direction a little more or that would be really useful in this situation. Um, do any of you have any uh, regrets or think about maybe you should have taken a, one, one of one of your other audition characters zero regrets but i would have really enjoyed playing the nos character i'd come up with especially in this chronicle yeah, yeah. with with stuff i think a lot of juicy dilemmas that would have come up being mm -hmm. a nos in the coterie mm -hmm. uh so no i have zero regrets i'm i'm thrilled playing Bo. i like all the stuff that's coming the all the terrible stuff that's going to happen um and it's also very much outside of like Bo. While I have some of my normal kind of player quirks, being a Toriador is definitely outside of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to do that, I'm happy to. Um, but yeah, being I think being a Nos would have been really fun and and uh, intriguing in this specific chronicle. Oh man, if there was a Nos in this coterie, I would have so put the screws to you all. Oh, you would have had so many conflicts; it would have been crazy. Oh, right. I've I've often thought back to Sebastian and how fun it would have been to play him in this. <laughs> I, I will say I think about that all the time. One hundred percent love playing Rashad, but I would have loved to see how Cat and Marquise would have gotten along. I would love to see how my ministry and Gwen would have gotten along, uh, and then even the the La Sombra version of Rashad would have been fun to see how him and Bella got along in the Camarilla City. So I, I, there are so many. So many alternative paths that could have been taken. I wish my Ravnos was actually playable. <laughs> <laughs> she was fun as fuck. <laughs> yeah, they're tough to, to make. I will, I will say I was also very, very much considering playing Bo as a Kaitif as, as well. Uh, but as a newer player, I didn't want to add that extra level of challenge to it. There's a lot of, even in this city, and Tanya doesn't get a lot of hate because of her position, honestly. Right. Uh, any other Kai Tief, you'd have to deal with the the, bias. the stigma that goes with it, the bias. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it in other parts, it gives you a slight advantage because even the Sabat even looked down on Kai Tief. I know they have the panders that they granted formal Sabat access, but even the panders... Our Pandas have to work three times as hard as anyone else to get the same recognition or the same recognition. So Kaitif are still looked down on by the Sabbat. So Yeah. Kaitif can be hard if you're new. Yeah. So my question for the group. Least favorite part of the season. Scene, storyline, whatever. Least favorite part of the season.
But I'll say I don't have a least favorite product. I enjoy most of the things. Um, I will say since I my character is not a combat character, the balance of combat is something I'm a little bit concerned about, but so far has been a big issue. Uh, so I won't say that I've had anything I don't like happen, though. And I will say this has been the most combat in a Shanky game so far. Uh, I don't plan to have as much well after the events that just happened. Uh, unless you are looking for combat, there's going to be a little less combat because of the events that just happened. Mm -hmm. They got to keep their, even this bot has to keep their head down a bit because the feds are in town. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's more combat than I thought would happen. I'll be honest. But if I don't do some combat, I mean, Cat is built around. She had to be because nobody else was. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. She's built around it. So, yeah. <laughs> she had to be because nobody else was. Otherwise, we would be just bystanders in a fucking war. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I see a little less combat, though. Uh, there's still going to be chances for. Uh, uh, Cat can do things without doing combat. Uh, mm -hmm. She can be intimidating as fuck even without combat. Yeah, she can. She absolutely can. She doesn't have to lay a finger on people to scare the shit out of them. Yep. <laughs> when does it need to be intimidating to be intimidating? That's true. <laughs> yeah, true. So least favorite parts. I, I get your combat. Rashad is so far from combat capable. But I will say Rashad is perfect because not just the combat side, uh, Rashad's moral guidelines there, your your convictions. Uh, you need to be more the eyes and ears and, and watching. Uh, what Gwen was doing in that episode where she's on the building and she's relaying information she sees, honestly, that is a job for Rashad. You have uh, Scry the Soul that you can use from on top of buildings. Yep. Uh, so you can see auras and pick out, you know, the dangers in the crowd. You should be up there on top of the building relaying the shit, you know, saying that over here, there's one over there. Yeah. I can see this. And using the sense of the unseen while you're up there to make sure nothing secret's coming. Um, and then the face is working in conjunction to mark targets and fucking, you know, tell everyone, okay, engage this one, or engage this one. The riot was one thing, or to shape the crowd, to move the crowd certain ways using the faces. Yeah, too. The faces can can do the crowd control. While Gwen sneaks around invisible to, to be the, the, the ninja attack when nobody's looking. And Kat's- While the Kat's drawing attention and, to herself. Right. I mean, there's there's a way Rashad, who doesn't do combat, could- would be effective in the role, being able to sense the unseen to be able to relay what you see with that, you know, by getting the bird's eye view, by being the Batman of the group. Yeah. You're on top of the you're building. Batman. Yeah. You're the Batman on the building. <laughs> you know, that's an important uh, thing yeah. that Rashad can do without being in the combat. And I, I, I think honestly, I been... go ahead. Go finish. Ahead. I was just saying, honestly, I I've said that a couple of times. I'm looking at Rashad to see what he's, how he's reacting. <laughs> Just because of your abilities. Right. Yeah, I'm thinking next season, I wish I was going to get a sniper rifle for something. I'm not sure why or like the how, but I think that's what I think he's going to lean towards the, the occult role properly. So it should be fun. That's a good, you can be up there spotting. And, and, and even if you don't shoot it because of your convictions uh, up there with a scope, you can see a lot. If you're not using an electronic scope, that means since the unseen works through it, mm -hmm. you can pierce obfuscate. You can set up with binoculars, do the same thing, too. As long as they're not electronic, guess what? But I made the suggestion to Re that, you know, if he would want Rashad to occasionally be able to engage targets, consider a sniper rifle. Yeah, sniper rifle works well. Or if you insist on being close, shotgun. Mm hmm Book shots a bitch, even to a vampire. Let me tell you, close range. Shotgun is painful. Yeah, guns don't kill Kindred that easily. But let me tell you, you get tagged at close range with, with you know, double lot buck. You know you got tagged. Mm -hmm. At close range, you, go, you know you got hit. That's what Lynn's ghouls did in, in uh, Windy City. One of them, he wasn't the greatest fighter, so he just carried a double barrel salt off that he liked to use. Mm -hmm. Give him both barrels. Yep. Now he was more of her spotter. He was her her investigator. Her yep. PI, her eyes. Actually. Her eyes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And there, Beetle Spock in chat. You missed a lot of talk about about uh, Cameron there earlier. Sorry, Beetle Spock. You missed I didn't all the your character. <laughs> <laughs> but the consensus is it ain't going to end well for him. Oh fuck no! It's going to be tragic. It, 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 all vampire stories end in ashes and blood tears. Okay. <laughs> We're all going to feel very bad for him and for Gwen. 
Might, hopefully he gets a peaceful death. You know. So we got Rashad's. What's everybody else's? Everybody else saying. is feeling on the, 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 you know, most disliked part of the season. I think for Callum is finding opportunities to use his social skills over combat skills. He's been hard pressed to be effective in combat. So you all have an intel problem, Callum. My advice is storyteller. Since you have an intel problem, start networking, start get not even with mortals or not even with kindred, Uh, Mm. start going out to the bars, uh, have scenes where you're talking to the bartenders like you did in the gambling thing. Yeah. Uh, establish, uh, that was one thing Relin did at Windy City. Establish, you know, communication lines with bartenders. Uh, they see a lot of things uh, because people come in and out of bars all the time. Uh, and the dry cleaner guy. Dry cleaner guy, that's one of them. A lot of people bring mm-hmm. their clothes. Little things like that that you can do that isn't combat, you can gather intel. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. Just, you know, get a feel for them. Uh, because bartenders know when something's different in their place. Mm-hmm. Bartenders are a big one. Uh, restaurants that aren't yours. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the wait staff know when something different mm-hmm. is going on, you know. Uh, and Kindred don't eat. But Kindred hang out in bars. Uh, something that hasn't come up in this chronicle yet, which I'm surprised, uh, clubs. Clubs are meat markets. Guess where vampires, even Sabat, love to get their food from? Mm-hmm. Clubs. The fact that you haven't heard that somebody's running a club yet in the city should tell you somebody's running a fucking club in the city. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> there's always some vampires running clubs. And I can get us in. Yeah. You know? Make yourself known at a few of them. Mm-hmm. Because that's a social thing you can do to kind of manipulate crowds into giving you the info you need. Mm-hmm. Right. Maybe lean into that fame, hospitality background. Yeah. yeah. Go to the clubs. Find out who's dealing the Molly yeah. in a dance club. Yeah. That's a dealer. There gives you a dealer. Dealers know when to hide. Mm-hmm. That's one thing dealers are very good at, knowing when not to be around. That gives you intel. Yeah. There's my advice for you on that one. And I admit this season didn't have a lot of chances for the social to shine, but it it was because we had to, I had to, (laughs) I needed to show the Sabbat in their, you know, the vicious side of Sabbat this season. You didn't have that in the first season. You need, I needed to show uh, the stakes are real this season. And we were all building up to this fight. You needed to see the stakes were real, not just, you know, uh, nebulous kind of threat in the background. No, you need to see that. They're not fucking around in the city. You know, it's not Elysia with work talking shit. It's fucking real threat. So. Mm-hmm. So we need Bo and Cat still. And if Mama says it's all the uh, premonitions, I'm just going to shake my head. No, because we have two players that voluntarily took that fucking power. <laughs> <laughs> No regrets. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> no, I think it's brilliant that y'all did and that it presents slightly differently for each character. That's yep. brilliant. Um, I don't have a problem with that at all. I just as a I as a player struggle hard with that. So that's why I don't take it. <laughs> expect more pre- uh, Rashad. I, yeah, expect I, more chessboard premonitions. I would say I now look at Rashad's as kind of more the coterie where like stuff more directly related to the coterie where while the the daughters and the music might play into stuff that will directly impact us uh i feel like the daughters of cacophony's whims aren't necessarily always going to be in line with coterie interests right there or, is... or directly related to coterie interests i will admit Beyond the overall feel of each of your premonition being unique, I will admit there is a a theme to what each of your premonitions will generally deal with. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you're right. It is not the same theme. Mm -mm. Right. Each of you see things, premonitions about different types of things and about different uh, focus. 
I'll say not, you know, subjects. Rashad legit sees premonitions about our threats. And then says everything's fine. No, it's not. <laughs> but that fits as, as a lawyer, that fits Rashad's character. Yeah. But he literally sees premonitions about our threats. And so either we can deal with it or we'll be dead. Well, either way. Either way, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Uh, they said i don't think any least thing was something you directly did or threw at us shanky like there were just times like you know it would have been cool if my dice almost didn't almost get my ass turned into dust you know <laughs> Yeah, I, I would like to go through a session without being hunger for. for <laughs> Good luck. Do something about it. Don't rouse so much. <laughs> yeah, you, for those that don't know, Rashad has the worst luck of rousing. Mm -hmm. He fails three times as many rouse checks as he passes. Easy. Yeah. Um, don't feel the best we can, you know. I stumped mama. That's good. No, I'm just. Well, it's good that there's nothing like so glaring. Yeah, I'm just trying to think no. that it wasn't anything. There's nothing really like super like, oh, my God, I fucking hated it kind of thing. Um, I understand why the season was so intense. I do. I understand that there, and I, I'm not even disagreeing with the reasoning for it. Um, it did need to be shown. But I'm going to say that considering we have two players new to this system, I feel like it was rushing it a bit. They needed more time to get comfortable with their characters and figure out what their characters can do. And to piggyback off that, there was less time this season for players to pursue uh, personal storyline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that is my gripe about the season that I feel like it was premature. Right. And I acknowledge that, you know, it, it did make it hard for the players to pursue. And it also made it hard for them to figure out what the hell to do. But you're right. It needed to be shown. And also. It's a war, so I want it. It's all about keeping you off balance in a war. That's that's what a war is. Like I said, I right. don't necessarily disagree, but I think it was premature. I think it could have waited till season three to give people a little more time to, to feel fleshed out in their characters. I just didn't think but, season one felt visceral enough in terms of I real danger. I, I, and like I said, it's just for me, it's just a disagreement on, on how you paced it. I will say for season three, I'm I'm hoping to let the players focus a little more on their own personal storylines and how it inter and how they fit into the city. Mm -hmm. So I'm expecting season three to introduce more NPCs mm -hmm. uh, so that you all finally get to start meeting yeah, more of the kindred. Nobody. Right. Of the city. You all <laughs> have started to show that you're capable. So more of the city's vampires that aren't previously, they didn't know you from, you know, ship from Shinola when it come to you all. And now they're going to be able to acknowledge, okay, uh, we might want to know these people because they, are useful. They survive. They're helpful. We might want to get to know them, which also means you might get asked favors from them. You know, that's how you start building up your boons anyway, you mm -hmm. know, but so expect season three to have some more NPCs, more chances for you all to network because you're getting that name you need in the city. You're not nobodies anymore. And that's something I definitely want to play up more with with Bo. We got to, like you said, Rashad mentioned it was a scene he liked was the gambling stuff. Like, that's a big part of Bo's personality. Like, yeah, the chef stuff is at the top, but like him want going to whether CD or good like betting parlors and, and games of chance and risk, like big part of his personality. And I like I as a player want to be able to explore that more. And I'm hoping. Season three to explore more of that. Now there's still be some threat because oh, you know, sure. it's a war. Sure. Uh, but right. some of the threat is going to be generated by you all. Uh, I heard this Cody wants to go fucking teach a Giovanni a lesson. 
I, I don't know where I heard that, but I heard that the Scuderi wants to teach a Giovanni to stop sending his race to fuck with shit. Oh, oh that is priority number one next season. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and well, I mean, that brings up another question now, like within the coterie, it's like, am I, is it risky for me to go being a fetter? Like, I don't, like, I don't, I as a player or, or as Bo, it's like, Rashad knows the ghosty stuff. Like, is it bad if I'm there and there's an understanding that I am a fetter? Like, should I go? Or what's like what's the risk? Is it is it bad that I'm not there and in a support role, or is me being there a bad idea? You know, Rashad will say it's all going to be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> this might be. That's the thing. There's going to be the one time where he's like, "This might not be fine," and then like the world's ending. That's when the apocalypse is happening. <laughs> is when Rashad finally says, "This might not be fine." Or, hey, guys, I've got a bad feeling about this one. <laughs> <laughs> when he says this sounds dangerous. Yeah. But that's going to find out that it's Cappadocious under the city. And it's like, OK, now this this one's a problem. Dying White Cat's trying to tell you what the him. fucking Zemetian to do living in. OK. <laughs> uh, maybe it could be a Nagaraja. Could be, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, I it, it legit. I, I also kind of, I'm like, I, I, I it, it's kind of upsetting that um the antediluvian has his sights set on cat now, so that that's not okay. <laughs> uh, as storyteller, I'm gonna tell you, it'll be fine. No, it won't. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it not, won't. not much she can do about it. There My is it. There's nothing. I can do about that here. now. I didn't have some. a say in that, and now my character is going to be fucking lunch. So yeah, it's going to be a, great. <laughs> a, your your blood is probably too weak to be much used to it to eating it. So you no, instead up the instead she'll just be benefits. a new body for it. Yeah. Great. There's worse things to worry about than being eaten. Okay. <laughs> Might as well try to get you some benefits out of it. You know, as I say you often, do. when dealing with an old enough vampire. How subtle a form can manipulation take? Oh, yeah. At what point are your own decisions? Why did Kat shoot right. that property to build her fortress? Why at is what, she building a fortress? Why? At what point are your own decisions <laughs> made by you, the player, <laughs> going to turn out to be playing into the hands of the, the elders? Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I'm good at as storyteller, and I admit this, is I let the players do their own things. But a lot of times you don't realize it, but you're playing right into the hands of the story of you know, how subtle manipulation can take mm -hmm. because you're talking about being smarter than I am because they've lived through God knows what else. Anything you try, they've had tried on them once before, at least somebody's tried it. Try to do something that a, a Methuselah or antediluvian hasn't seen done yet. Come up with something new. I mean, a nuke, I mean, because they haven't seen a nuke go off yet. No, what we need is a las gun and a personal shield. Yeah, that's dune time. Yeah, you're just going to blow up blow up yourself that works I'll get someone to bring an ac-130 in we'll, we'll, we'll just call, call in some favors get an atomic bomb we'll be, I, we'll be set you I, know? I mean cat's mala does like to blow shit up well you mentioned the ac-130 just watch out for the predator drones not saying grant has he any has military but watch that. out for our predator drones just saying there are a few problems the military can't take care of for us, you know. We all right. Mm -hmm. We ban hammer. <laughs> <laughs> I love the ban hammer. Broke it out. So, any other questions from the viewers? Beetle Spock, Beetle Spock didn't ask a question. Will Cameron survive? We already know the answer to that. Maybe he didn't ask the question, but I'm gonna put it out there for him. I, I did say eight ball says outcome uncertain. I did say <laughs> whether Cameron survives or not is in the hands of the the five people, regular cast members. Mm -hmm. Um, it's possible he will survive. Your character's fate is in our hands. I'm not going to say it's likely, but it's possible. You know my opinion. You know my opinion. 
anything is possible. But yeah, the Magic Eight Ball does say outlook, uh, outlook uns- yeah, uncertain. Outlook uncertain. <laughs> Beatles, Spock, I will say that Callan was willing to give up a temporary point of resources to help you relocate if that was going to help. Devilish Darkness asked, you know you got the daughters, but do any sons exist? Yes, Mr. Tenor. Yeah. He is a son of, of uh, what do they call it? Uh, son of Discord. Son of Discord. Yep. Yes. He is a son. He is the third of the trio. Yep. Makes you wonder what their two names are if he's Mr. Tenor. Yep. Miss Soprano and Miss Alto. Oh, you... <laughs> Devil well, Stark just wants think... to be Mr. Bass. <sighs> well, I think our resident mage is going to be fine. He's going to New York and he's going to have a conversation with... If Dante. he stays a mage. Of those. Here's He'll the problem. If he, if he goes to New York, if he leaves the city... Will his family be alive when the plane lands? Right. Yeah. Right. Is he even going to be able to get on a plane to leave? If he tried to take a plane, uh, is he on a watch list? Is he even to even get out of the fucking city on a plane? Because if he has to drive to New York. No, the only solution is taking out Grant. <laughs> that if, is the only they solution. Die, they can just be brought back as wraiths later on. It's fine. <laughs> It's all going to be fine. Or you just embrace him and tell him, don't worry about that's, your family now. You've been embraced. That's that's Bo's thought. <laughs> Take I think Gwen would have some issue with embracing a touchstone. Yeah, just a wee bit. That, well, that's a problem. I mean, <laughs> the options aren't great in general. <clears throat> the fact right. that she made him a touchstone has got so many possibilities for me for just bad, bad things to happen at a great story. Again, the, the concern that you brought up earlier was like the screws being put on him or her in regards to them is a big issue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But see, a the coterie doesn't know he's the touchstone to her. Right. Not yet. No. Not yet. No. She's just awful protective of him. Like, which is t- suspicious. Turn, turn his ass, and then you'll be a little safer. Mm-hmm. His family might not. I'm sorry, but. Yeah. It's the right, yeah. In Bo's head, it's the right call. Blood bond him. At least blood bond him. He yeah. Some, some that's powers. that's Callum's thing, too. Just blood, Just blood, blood bond him, at least. Well, we already know Kat mm-hmm. said to do it. She said it right fucking away. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> fucking, blo- fucking bond him. <laughs> and I will stain her, give her stains the moment she does it. Yeah. Uh, because and he's a touchstone. If she ever lets it fail. Yeah. Yep. I'll give her stains for the blood bonding. Uh, if she ever lets the uh, ghouling stop, I'll stain her again for it. Uh, because blood bonding is changing how they feel. It is not a positive effect to put on a touchstone. Oh, uh, sometimes you might want to take that stain. Humanity. Yeah. But yeah. I will stain her for every that. time she increases the bond, too. Because she is enforcing her will upon him. That is not uh, a positive thing. So him. Uh, turn it's tough on him. Her. Him. Turn him. Turn him. He's you know, Bo, you on the ride you could, to low humanity. You could do it. <laughs> I've I've told you how terrified I am of Gwen, right? Here's, and the funny <laughs> thing about stains and convi- and touchstones, if Bo ghouls him, and Gwen finds out, or go, Bo blood bonds him, and Gwen finds out, and she allows that to continue, she will mm-hmm. incur stains for Bo doing it mm-hmm. because yeah. she allowed a touchstone to be harmed. Mm-hmm. It is. Her making that touchstone is such great story, yeah. but it is a loaded gun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is, you know, 400 year old dynamite or some shit. It is so, or not 400, 200 year old dynamite. It's so unstable that you look at it wrong. It's going to blow up in everybody's face. All right. So we're going to wrap it for tonight. Thank you viewers for joining us and asking some very intriguing questions about our Chronicle so far. <laughs> so much shit. Uh, it's been a fun season, I will say. And I want to, I, before I go into my normal spiel, I do thank my players for it. Without the players and you, the viewers, honestly, this Chronicle wouldn't be here. Uh, this, this is all, we do this to play with people we don't normally get to play with. And we do this to tell a story for the viewers. 
if the viewers weren't here, we didn't have this community to tell the story to. I, I'll be fair. Uh, there are times it's rough streaming. The schedules we set sometimes is rough on us as a studio because we're running juggling multiple games. Uh, if it wasn't for the viewers in the community that enjoy the stories, at some point you, we'd probably gotten disheartened and just stopped doing it. So mm -hmm. uh, I do want to thank everyone that's here. Uh, for this because without you and the, the cast of our shows otherwise it'd be just me and Relin. No, maybe you're any you once in a while but you know <laughs> that would have been the whole stream and it's not the same without the cast we have the guest players mm -hmm. uh beetle spock bringing the heat he brings that emotional fire to it ravenous archon that snark <laughs> and maddox just fucking being that that menacingly without being menacing kind of maddox thing that he plays you know so I got to say it's uh and we have more guests coming. Yep, we got more guests coming. It, it's I am thankful to the players that put up that do this schedule because I mean they're putting aside time every week uh that and the viewers that come out every week to watch it this stream and all the others so I just wanted to say that before we go into our spiel about join us on the Discord. Uh Discord is where we cast this show and as a matter of fact, there's still an open casting call for just over a week. Yep. For our big uh, Queen's Gambit, World of Darkness, which is going to be five different splats with five different storytellers telling one coherent story across, I think it's a total of 17 episodes, but that's because there's a, a pre, uh, a, pre a prologue, a prologue and, and an epilogue and an epilogue, the final episode to, to seal it all up. So yeah, uh, if you're interested in playing with us, check out our casting couch. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, just pop over to Discord, hang out. We've got a good community. Everybody's real friendly over there. Uh, we talk about not just games. Sometimes we get taunted by the uh, cook tees down there, Bo uh, House, who uh, on our Discord posts amazing food pictures. Yeah. You know, we've got people who on the Discord post, uh, well, they've got a loom and they're they're making their own fabric, which is fucking awesome. That's fucking awesome. It, it's cool as <laughs> shit to see. Uh, we've got a real supportive community. We talk about all kinds of things. So a very just, diverse international community of amazing people. So. For yep. Real. So be on our Discord. It, it's and you also get to you know hear about stuff we're playing in ahead of time a lot of mm -hmm. times because we talk about it there. And sometimes we even manage to do a Zoom hangout, which uh, we'll be talking about that in a minute because we do have one planned coming up at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, so join us on Discord. Uh, pop over to our YouTube. You want to see our back episodes? YouTube. We've got season one and two of this chronicle. Uh, two seasons of Demon, which is returning uh, in September, October. That range. Demon will come back for season three. Uh, we've got Changeling that's coming up. Mage, our brand new Chronicle of It's coming up, but we had the previous uh, multiple miniseries, multi-season miniseries. Uh, Dune, we got a new season of that coming up. Whole new story to tell there. And at some point there will be a werewolf game in the works. There'll be a werewolf game. At some point there'll be Broken Tales up on there. So mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff. Our YouTube has so much content. And if you like Call of Cthulhu or D&D &D 5e, you go over to Ishvel's channel. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, go to our channels, uh, recommended channels on our YouTube page. Ishvel's link there. You can pop over there and see DM Tiss. She's our doctor of the uh, Discord. She's Dr. Tiss. She's actually a doctor, uh, not, not a medical, medical doctor, but she's she's got a doctor. <laughs> she's got her PhD. Yep. And uh, she's she runs those games, so she puts them on her channel. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to catch uh, some of our amazing other friends we have? Check out our friends channel. Uh, Mischievous Red, who's not here, uh, Juni. Runs the RPG table. You'll see Junie in a number of our streams. Uh, and Ravenous Archon, who uh, is the guest player in this one, but he also streams Mage for us and a couple of things like that, Dune. Uh, and he has his own channel as well. So check that out. You want to get you some studio merch. I swear to God, eventually we'll get merch updated. Uh, but again, what I said about the time and effort that goes into things, uh, we've got to have time to do it in between our day jobs, our family life, our personal boundaries, and running all these streams. Uh, it's hard to get merch done, and we're not artists. No. I don't do art for the fun of it. <laughs> you know, I, I paint miniatures for the fun of it, but I can't make that a merchandising, okay? Yeah. You don't need a shanky miniature. You don't need that. Maybe you're any miniature to curse your dice with. <laughs> I can say that now. We're between seasons. It's okay. It's not cursing anything. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to support the players? Bits and donations go to the players, not to the studio. I saw some bits came out earlier. I know uh, your any gave some bits to everybody. So bits and do or bits and donations that go to the players. Uh, if you want to give something to the studio, subscribe here on Twitch. They're going to take half, but at least you get no ads. That's a plus. 
uh, or you can pop it over a coffee and you can give us a coffee over there. Uh, they don't take half, thank God. If you watch on YouTube, like the video, comment on the video, uh, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification icon. All that supports the studio. And YouTube, it's free to do all that on YouTube. And it gets us more viewers on YouTube and brings more people to the channel, more to the community. And it, it, it you know, builds up that way. So check that out. Um, I did my, oh, perfect. I did my, my part. Now mama can give the schedule, which is surprising this week. <laughs> okay. So hang on. I'm checking something. Yep. They're playing tomorrow. Okay. So tomorrow we have, they are playing tomorrow. Yep. Okay. Because the last pin schedule in their cast chat was through April 6th. Yeah, she mentioned she needs to do a new schedule. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, Call of Cthulhu tomorrow, 3 p.m. Eastern. It's Call of Cthulhu 7E, set in Victorian era London and surrounding environs. 3 p.m. Eastern. Join them. Yeah. There's all kind. There, there needs to be more cheese murder and more bodies buried in the garden. And I'm still mad. That John Greaves has not died yet. Damn it. Someone needs to kill your any. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Should have named his character Nicholas, and then I would have paid Tiss to kill him. Yeah. So that's coming up tomorrow. And then for the rest of the week, we have no streams. I know our preview reels said that we had some games starting up. We were expecting to start up Dune and Mage next week, but unfortunately, Ravnos Archon had to go back into the hospital, y'all. So we are giving him an extra week to rest and recover before starting up two games on our channel. So please be patient with us. We are going to be streaming them the following week, um, as far as we know. So we're kind but of playing it by ear. On the plus side, it gives me a week to do some studio th mm -hmm. changes and updates I needed to do here in the studio which means I can physically move stuff without it, you know, impacting our stream schedule and our games. Yep. We've got to do some work in here. So, yep, I've been keeping close tabs on him, making sure he's doing okay. And, and we're, yep, we're delaying it by a week. It's not going to offset anything following. Um, we are adjusting the run of his games to make sure that we can still have everything else stream as scheduled. So but we will be streaming the new Mage Chronicle. It will happen. It will. Right now, it's it's scheduled for the 7th. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, sorry. Sorry. The 8th. No, wait a minute. No, the 1st. The 1st. Yeah, the 1st. Yeah. Sorry, first. I'm way off all week. The 1st of May. The 1st yeah. of May and then the 3rd of May for Dune. Yep, the and, uh, May for Dune. I'm going to be in Dune. Mama's going to be in Dune. Mm -hmm. uh, Callie Salvo is going to be in Dune. You saw him in Star Wars. It'd be fun to play with him. Mm -hmm. uh, and Junie, of course. So. Yeah. So that's the plan is the first week, the first. And 3rd of May is when we're going to be streaming those games. Yep. So. So, yeah, we got to take, we're taking the, you know, we can use the week off too. I'll be fair. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mama just ended her second week at her new job. And I, I, while I love this new job, it is so much less stressful than everything I've done in the past. It is amazing. I'm still getting adapted to the new schedule and everything. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and I honestly have not had a week off of streaming in. Mm hmm well, I know this year plus a good part of last year. So uh, having a week off will be good. Yeah. I've got some work I got to do behind the scenes anyway. Yeah. I got to fix fantasy grounds. Yeah. So, so. but yeah. And uh, also coming up that week on the 30th is going to be the next monster of the month on April 30th at 8 p.m. Eastern. So we take a week off. Then you get a Tuesday, a, a Wednesday, Wednesday and, and a Friday. Friday. Mm-hmm. And maybe Saturday and if Tess is Saturday. playing that week. Yeah, lots of games. So, so yeah. yeah, Monster of the Month, Mage, Dune, Call of Cthulhu, all coming up the end of April, early May. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and now I can let people uh, read. Tell everybody where you can find you. Put your link in the chat so that people can check on what you got going on. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so you can always find me over on uh, over on Rerolls, the Twitch channel. Uh, Bourbon Street Blues will continue as our as Michi has learned that someone has has killed a a broodmate. So there is some some punishment that must be extracted for that. Um, and that's all for me in these upcoming days. But uh, stay tuned. One of these days, I'm gonna not be busy on a Sunday and get to watch your stream. 
But man, it's killing me half the time. I'm so, you know, weekend is the only time I get to do all the shit I didn't do all week. But tomorrow I got Never stuff to do in the time. yard all day. Welcome. That's going to, you know, break me down. So but seriously, check out re-rolls. Rashad down here. Check them out. Go check that out. Uh, Bo, you still on hold for your project for now? Yep. Yep. No creative stuff right now outside of the food stuffs. And seriously, join our Discord just to go to the Food Network and see the food. The, the burger he posted today fucking looked amazing. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it just. Oh. All I can get around here is McDonald's and Five Guys. <laughs> and Burger King if I want food poisoning. Hey, but I cooked brats last night. <laughs> yep, but, it, you know, I'm talking the burger he posted. You yeah, know. I know. They don't add up. So I know. check that out. And uh, as always, everybody, when we end these streams, uh, mental health. It's not a joke. It's not a laughing matter. I want you to take your mental health seriously and the mental health of others seriously. Please check in on those around you. Reach out to them. Make sure they're okay. A lot of people aren't. And sometimes it just takes a kind word, a voice saying you're okay to, to help people off the ledge. And if you suffer from mental health issues like many of us do, myself included, in chat, there's a list of numbers you can call or text 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And there'll be a professional on the other end of the line. Because I understand a lot of people don't feel they can reach out to those around them because they don't want to be a burden on them. And uh, I understand it. It's tough sometimes. So if you feel you're in crisis, at least reach out to the professionals because they know what they're doing on the end of the line. They know why they're a lot of times volunteers uh, answering those phones. So uh, please do that. Okay. Uh, mental health is health and we want you to be okay. And while it's okay to not be okay, we still want you to get better. And if you're not in the U S or you're watching this on YouTube, go to findahelpline.com, put in your country of origin, get the helplines you need for your country. Because I know we have a, not, a lot of non-U.S. viewers. One of them was in chat tonight until we had to go to bed, Astral. Uh, we've got a number of non-U.S. viewers. So please, take care of yourself. And now I can turn it over to my lovely wife for her portion of the outro. All right. So make sure you're taking care of your mental well-being. Preserve your peace. And also take care of your physical well-being. Seriously, take care of yourself. Pay attention if your body's telling you something's wrong. Get it checked out. Please get it checked out. Don't wait until you're knocking on death's door. Okay, for real. Um, make sure you take care of that because the body and the mind work hand in hand. For real. And if one isn't well, the other one is not going to be well very shortly after. Trust me. Um, so. Literally do it. Um, right now we are out of season for the flu shot, for getting your flu shot, but plan on in the fall getting that if you haven't. Um, and also make sure that you do get your COVID booster because it is still around and it is still hospitalizing and killing people. So it's never going away because we haven't cured any viruses yet. Um, so, you know, common cold still kicks people's butts. But, you know, I'm just saying so. Yeah, please take care of that um, and make sure you are registered to vote and that you participate in your elections in your state. Um, make sure that if there are primaries coming up in your state that you do participate in those because that's how you determine who's on your ballot. Um, so, yeah, make sure that you do it because, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, there's been some things going on in states here in the U.S. over the last couple of weeks that is very um, not OK. And. People need to. Show up, show the fuck up primaries and the general election in November, show the fuck up because being passive, being apathetic isn't going to change a goddamn thing. And literally, bigots, fascists, racists, white supremacists, fucking monsters are trying to take away rights from people state by state. It's so fucking important that we get them out of office. And our entire federal house of representatives is up for election. Let's try to preserve some fucking human rights. Yep. So I would love. And uh, I do thank everyone for coming. Again, we couldn't do this without the cast and the viewers. So uh, thank you, everyone. We'll see you after our week break for Mage, Dune, 
uh, Monster of the Month, and maybe Call of Cthulhu. Tiss sets her schedule. We don't. So good night, everybody.